Stories of the Night, Four Shadowy Tales Written by J.T. Ellison Narrated by Courtney Parker and Basil Sands Catwood J.T. Ellison I had forgotten how the frogs must sound after a year of silence, else I think I should not so have ventured forth alone at dusk upon this unfrequented road. Edna St. Vincent Millay She floats face down, her brown hair a fan around her head. Her red sweater has a hole in it. She still wears her sneakers. The water is murky and shallow. Reeds and stems poke up around the edges. Dragonflies flit among the stalks. The early morning air is chilly. Crickets and cicadas rumble in the thicket. A lone frog cries his frustration. The trees stand guard over the scene, a gentle breeze passing through them, making them shiver and drop their leaves in horror at the sight below. A fly lands on her shoulder. I should call the police. I'll have to take the car and drive out. There is no service here, which is why we chose it. No wireless, no cell service, no interruptions. Where is everyone? The silence is overwhelming. Why did it have to be me who found her? Why? I watch her bob there, the water holding her in its gentle embrace, kinder and better than anything she got from the rest of the world, and think, it couldn't have ended any other way, and start to scream her name. There are five of us heading to the lake, a long overdue get-together to commiserate, drink, and in general catch up. Oh, we are supposed to be working. That's what we've told our better halves. A working weekend with the girls. No internet, no phones. We'll be unreachable in a small cabin in the woods. Only the house and lake and laptops as our companions. Justifications abound. We have plans. There is enough wine to drown a regiment. We have an agenda. I've brought all of my Harry Potter discs. We're going to alternate writing with business discussions. We're going to gossip until our lips bleed. The better halves help us pack. Most, at least. There's one who stormed out and didn't come back until after she was gone so she left a note with the caretaker's phone number, just in case. Fill up our gas tanks, carry the bags to the car, kiss our pretty little heads goodbye, assure us they will be just fine. It is only three days, after all. And wave as we drive away. I remember thinking, it's a retreat. It will be a few days to gossip and eat and drink and hopefully write. What can possibly go wrong? We meet up at a travel gas station on I-65 South. Five cars. That's silly, so we park and all get into mine. No sense wasting all that gas. Like I said, we're riders, which means we're all on a budget. I drive. I have control issues and anxiety issues, and the idea of not having my own car on a road trip is enough to send me into paroxysms so everyone agreed in advance that it will fall upon me to take the wheel. They're good friends. They make it sound like it is their idea. The drive is four hours. South, into the mountains between Tennessee and Georgia. We stop for road trip supplies. We sing to the radio. There is the sharp scent of rum from the back seat. Ellie has her tiny flask out already. I glance in the rear view and to the side. Ellie, Tess, and Carter are in the back seat. Francis is up front with me. Ellie, Tess, Carter, Francis, and me, Rebecca. The dream team, the five musketeers, my besties, my team, my crowd, my peeps. The girls who get me through every high and low of my career as I do for them. Everyone in town is jealous of our bond. We came into publishing around the same time, 
met at a local author event at the local bookstore, and have been thick as thieves since. I can't imagine my life without any of them. It's hard to believe that before the weekend is out, one of us will be dead. It is dark when we arrive. Dusk, really. The sky a light gray. But the forest is thick around us, and it's dim enough that we have to break out the flashlights to find the front door and the keys that were left by the owner for us. This is my fault, though no one wants to blame me. I took a wrong turn, and we got lost on top of this strange mountain, where the trees reach over the road and stop the perspective views we had from the highway. The GPS stopped working halfway up, as the rental company warned us would happen. The paper map they provided, though, is worthless. Later, we will find out the sign has fallen, rotted out from the heavy winter weather. But at the time, it is downright creepy driving up and down the small country roads, trying to find our way in. That's why I missed the house at the end of the lane. Once our supplies are hauled in from the car under cover of flashlights, we drink some of the wine and tell a few stories. But the mood is ruined by our late arrival, and eventually we peel off one by one to the various bedrooms and nooks and Murphy beds responsible for our weekend rest. Carter and Francie take the bunk beds. They've always been in each other's pockets and don't mind sharing. And Tess claims the small room behind the kitchen. Ellie climbs the stairs to the loft. Once I straighten the kitchen and lock the doors, I head to the master suite, the biggest room, with the private bathroom. I am paying more than the others so I can have this privacy. They understand. I am not holding myself apart. I am simply uncomfortable around people for long, even my dearest friends. The sky is darker than anything I've ever seen. I pull the curtains, suddenly uncomfortable with the idea of someone being able to look in on me as I sleep. I hate first-floor bedrooms. Someone can watch. Someone can climb right in while you're sleeping and you wouldn't ever know. On a second floor, or even a third, there are stairs that creak, hallways with floorboards that pop and crack, so no one can sneak up on you. When my floor, my bed, my most vulnerable self is accessible by anyone, stop. Don't do this. You're safe. You're fine. Quit acting like a child. There are no boogeymen in the woods waiting to take you away. But as I stand in my pajamas in front of the spotted mirror, brush my teeth and hair, the little voice that lives in my lower spine says, You should have taken the loft. I wake early. I never really slept. And decide a walk is in order. No one else is awake yet, though I hear a small sound from the loft. Ellie is dreaming. I leave through the back door. I press five feet into the brush down a tiny path, and a charming lake appears. There is a dock, canoes, seats. We saw none of this last night. The girls will be thrilled. I am already envisioning yoga on the faded wood, the cool night air caressing our unblemished skin. There is a path that I assume goes around the lake, which is rather small. Probably two miles around. I can see the other side. I know from the website there are four houses that share the acreage. I set off, grabbing a large stick to use as a shillelagh in case of snakes or bears. Most of the path is choked by brush. No one has tended it. But after a few minutes, the track widens, and I walk freely. I'm beginning to feel the sun on my bare shoulders when I see it. There is a house at the end of the lane. We must have driven by it as we wound our way into the woods last night, because as the crow flies, it's on the opposite side of the lake, but it's not in plain view. There is only one road, which means it's either the first driveway or the last, but I wasn't paying attention. The house is gargantuan, symmetrical, 
Stately stone chimneys rise from either side, fronted by a three-peaked roof. Cream stone blocks are overlaid with crawling ivy. There are ten mullioned windows. A mansion in the middle of the woods. So incongruous. It is the kind of house people build to be admired, not to be hidden away but it looks as if no one has lived there for a very long time. Maybe this land belonged to the owners of this majestic place, and they were forced to sell it off to pay the taxes. Or does that only happen in England? It is an English house, one that would suit the countryside in the Lake District or Devonshire perfectly. It's not what I'd expect in Rising Fawn, Georgia. I realize I am still staring one hand wound around the wrought iron gate. The gates themselves are huge, too, well above my head, and stand open in readiness. For what? Impressed, I drag myself away to finish my walk. There is much writing to be done, and I am pleasantly hungry. The house stands guard behind me, watching, waiting. I turn at the curve of the lake, it sparkles serenely, catching the light above. The trees are a shroud, but the sun is strong this early morning, and the water rises up to meet it happily. I feel good. This is going to be a fun few days. I love being with my friends. I love being in a new place. Yesterday's frustrations are beat out of my body as my feet pound the path. I check my steps. Forty-five hundred. Excellent. Well on the way to my goal. I am so fixated on my wrist that I almost miss it. The sign is crooked, a pointed arrow and weathered gray. Come see the cave at Catwood. Catwood? Is that the name of the house or the land here? And is there a cave? I love caves. I like how each one is a microcosm of the world living unto itself, not at all concerned with the outer world, like blood in a vein, doing its business regardless of the external forces driving it, nourishing and restorative. I follow the tiny offshoot path deeper into the woods, mindful to check myself for ticks when I get back, though it's early in the season, they might not be out yet. I don't usually pick up ticks or mosquito bites, some odd freak of nature genetic lottery that makes me untasty to the seeking bugs. But these long grasses are full of them, so check I must. Who was it that lived in a cave in Greek myth? Pan to the nymph of the Caritian cave? Or am I thinking more of Plato and the allegory with which I've always been fascinated? I'm upon the cave with almost no warning. The mouth is jagged, the grass waist-high. There have been no visitors here for some time. It is untended, and that makes me sad. Perhaps an animal or two make a nest inside, but I sense great emptiness and loneliness. The disuse is a shame, really. It's a perfectly good cave, and not at all far from the house and the lake. It feels friendly as if it would like to be rediscovered. I step to the edge, I'm not so stupid as to go deep inside without supplies, and stick in my head, using the flashlight on my phone to assess the state of things. I see nothing to fear, so I move inside carefully. The wind sounds different in here. The walls are cool and lined with lichen and moss. I imagine what it would be like to live in this quietude, day in and day out, alone, a hermit, and find the thought suits me. I'm a great romantic when it comes to the idea of solitude. I crave it, seek it out, and yet always find myself surrounded by people. I've never understood this. I stand in the darkness and breathe deeply. It is a good cave. Happy and sated, I walk back to the cabin. Ellie is making breakfast. 
There are mimosas and friends whom I love waiting for me. I will write a story for them, my friends, and do yoga with them on the dock, and feel the breeze rustle the leaves and our hair and fill us, and tonight we will drink wine and talk more about our dreams and our fears. And that is how our day goes. There is a hole in the side of the mountain. People are lined up to go inside. It is a cave, my cave, clearly, and it must be a very deep one, because all the people disappear inside, but don't come out again for a very long time. A Natural Wonder of the World A small lady with wildly curly gray hair and cat-blue eyes stands outside waving the people in. I get in line. I move closer, ever closer, until I am face to face with the woman. Her pupils are vertical, her skin unlined. Her face is years younger than her body. Leave your fear behind. It will only cost you a dime. But I have no money. Then give me your hand. I do, anxious now. I need to get inside. I feel the wind begin deep in the valley behind me, and I know I must be inside the cave when the wind comes, or I will be in serious trouble. Ah, she says, standing over my hand, stroking and caressing. You are one of us. You have been chosen. You may go inside. I scurry in before she changes her mind so the wind will not get me. I am the last person in line. The woman steps to the entrance of the cave behind me and screams. My hair stands on end. The pitch hits a note inside me, and I want to wail and rend my clothes in response. Her cry carries into the valley, and the wind rushes faster to greet her. It is shrieking and screaming, moaning as it tries to get inside, wanting, so wanting. But she holds firm, standing with arms up and legs spread, a barrier between us and the soul stealer. I was in a hurricane once. The wind blew and blew, the trees bent sideways, the fences came down and the birds were all killed because they were caught in the eye for hours and couldn't land. Exhausted, they dropped like stones and washed up on the beach a few days later, littering the sand with their plump, bloated bodies. I sense the birds in the wind, caught in the maelstrom. They are coming closer and closer, and the old woman stands firm in the face of their fury and screams, Catch wood at them. We stand shoulder to shoulder in the cave, screaming the word with her, chanting over and over, Catch wood, catch wood, catch wood. The wind stops with an unearthly howl of anguish, gushing up against the invisible barrier the woman has cast between us. The birds drop dead at her feet, hundreds of them, all different kinds, and she lies down and dies with them. I come awake with a start. My heart is pounding in my chest so hard it hurts, and I realize I've been screaming aloud because Ellie is standing over the bed with her cell phone flashlight on saying, Rebecca, Rebecca. It's okay. It's just a dream. Oh, God. It's just a dream. But when are my dreams only dreams? I'm okay, Ellie. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to wake you. It's okay, sweetie. She hugs me, and her breath smells like piña coladas, like the beach. I had a strange one, too. Must be this cabin. So many creatives have stayed here. They left some of their crazy behind. What was yours about? Her face drops. Vera left me. Oh, that's harsh. I hate dreams like that. No, I mean, 
She left me, for real. She's moving on. She took a job in Seattle and didn't invite me to come with. Oh, Ellie. This explains the heavy drinking that's been going on. I wrap my arms around her and hold on tight, waiting for the tears. They don't come. No sobbing, no shaking. She's stiff as a board with tension, but otherwise resigned. You okay? I think so. I'm all cried out. Maybe I'll kill her in a story. Might make me feel better. She stands up. You want me to shut your curtain so the morning sun won't wake you up? It's all right. I'll do it. Good night, honey. Thanks for waking me up. I really am sorry about Vera. Don't tell the others. I'm not ready to be dissected. I won't, I promise. She tiptoes away, and I look to the windows, dread filling me. The curtains are all wide open. The next morning, to shake off the dream and the sad news of Ellie and Vera's demise, I set off on another walk. I go the opposite direction this time. The words I've written the previous day, what few there were, we talked as much as we wrote, glow brightly in my mind. They are good words. I am on to a new story, something challenging and exciting. I don't normally write about happy things. My work tends toward the dark and dramatic. But I was hit with the idea as we drank our wine and ate our chicken salad and talked about how we like to be loved. Love. Why not write a story about love for once? A happy love with a happy ending. Can I do it? Can I write something that isn't so dark? I am consumed by darkness. There is a reason. I'm not being dramatic. I'm over my goth years, mostly. When I was in my early twenties, a friend had a party and hired a palm reader to entertain. I had no interest in joining the fun. I didn't want to know my fate, even one custom made to please by a house medium. One by one, friends and acquaintances and strangers disappeared into a dark corner of the ballroom, separated from the rest by a long silver curtain. One by one, they came out again, eyes wide, smiles huge. I'm going to be rich. I'm going to be famous. I'm going to marry Tad. Simply ridiculous, I thought to myself, having another drink. Who would waste their time on such frivolities? I was the only one in the room who didn't disappear behind the curtain, though my friends egged me on. Finally, the hostess, being a royal canine bitch, tracked me down. You're being a spoil sport. Everyone else did it. If everyone else jumped off a bridge, would you expect me to follow suit? No, Rebecca, I'd expect you to have good manners to go along with something utterly harmless so people will stop talking about you. Why do you always have to be the center of attention? Now that last was unfair of her. Being the center of attention was the very last thing I wanted. It was not my fault that I stood out from the crowd. Tall women always do. I'm not doing anything. Yes, you are. You're ruining my party, she cried, flouncing off to be ministered to by her minions. Oh, for God's sake. Drama queen much? So now everyone was paying attention to me, and I had no choice but to slip behind the damn curtain myself. The woman was older, not plain, but not pretty. She would be easily forgotten if you bumped into her on the street, if you didn't look closely. But when I stepped in, she raised her face to mine curiously, her eyes violet, as dark as a midnight sun, with an eerie gold ring around the irises. I've been waiting for you. Why? Why didn't you just leave? I promised the hostess I'd read all the guests' palms. It was in our contract. You're my only holdout. Great. Not into fortune-telling? The hint of a laugh in her melodic voice made me take a breath. I relaxed. No, I'm not. My friend guilted me into it. You don't want to know your future? No. A, I don't believe in it. 
B. I want to live my life without some random prediction hanging over me. I believe we manifest our own destinies. If you look at my hand and tell me I'm going to die of cancer in three months, then I'll spend three months worrying about dying instead of living. I'd rather be ignorant and have bliss. Commendable. How's this? I'll make you a deal. If I see something bad, I won't tell you. Promise. Whatever. I sat down and thrust out my hand. Let's just get this over with. She hesitated only a moment, then took my hand in hers. She didn't look at it, simply ran her palm against mine, as intimate and startling as a lover's kiss. She turned my hand over in hers. Cool and soft, it was a gentle caress. Careless, even. Her brows knitted, and she turned my hand palm up, tracing her fingers lightly over my skin. Her hand tightened on mine. Oh, honey, you're one of us. What? What do you mean? You can see death. You can see it coming. You've been doing this since you were a child, you poor thing. You must be... Stop, this is ridiculous. But I knew it wasn't. She spoke the truth. I had a weird sort of knack for predicting death. It had been with me as long as I could remember. And it was something I never, ever discussed with anyone. No one knew. Her violet and gold eyes were empathetic and kind. The slight horror she'd shown when she first took my hand, gone now, replaced with understanding. We can teach you how to control it so you can shut them out. You don't have to live with the fear and chaos anymore. You don't need to be their conduit. I jerked my hand away. I have no idea what you're talking about. Please, take my card. Call me. I have people I can introduce you to. But I was gone, out the curtained wall, out of the party, and the simpering gazes of my gullible friends. Back at the house, I sip my morning tea, watching my friends goof off at the breakfast table. Ellie slightly quieter than the others, and wonder, if I had listened to the medium back then, would anything have been different? We have each found our place in the house. I prefer a view of the water, and so the deck couch is mine. It is under a pitched cedar roof, and it's early spring, so I'm a bit chilly in the shade. I light a fire, and it warms things up nicely. I write my love story, praying it won't take a turn for the worse. It's hard for me to write anything that doesn't have a death in it. Thanks a lot, fortune teller, for manifesting that destiny for me. Though maybe it's better. Since my run-in with her, I've learned things, how to shield myself, how to look away when the small movements begin out of the corner of my eye, how to protect my dreams from the dead. It almost always works, almost always. Last night's bizarre dream aside, I haven't had a dream about death in months. So far today, none of my characters have died, so there's a bonus. For our afternoon break, I tell the girls I want to show them something special, and they faithfully troop out the door with me, down the path to the mansion. The gates still stand open and welcoming. What a wonderful house, they cry. Let's go inside, I reply. Rebecca, Francie says, we'll get in trouble if we do. No, we won't. It will be fun, I promise. No one's here. It's clearly abandoned. Not a good idea, sugar, Tess says. We might get hurt. You never know if there's a floorboard loose or something else. We'd be trespassing. Tess, the mother of the group, always looking for hidden dangers. Ellie shushes her. Come on, don't be a baby. I think it's a great idea. Here's what we should do. Let's go in and check things out. And tonight, as a writing exercise, we can all write a short story about the house. Something quick and easy. But it will be a fun exercise. I like writing about inanimate objects. All right, Ellie, I think that's a great idea, Tess says, fluffing her hair off her shoulders. God, it's hot right here. The breeze has died. 
She manhandles the mass into a ponytail, fans her neck. Ah, that's better. Francie is still staring at the house, unmoving, but I set off toward the drive, and Tess and Ellie follow. Carter, though, shakes her head. I'll see you guys later. I'm not one for ghosts and haunted houses. It's not haunted, silly. It's just someone's lake house, I reply. If that's the case, then you're going to be trespassing. You and Tess and Ellie go on ahead. I think Francie and I are going to go back. We'll make lunch, have it all ready for y'all when you come back with the details of what's inside. Right, Francie? Francie, who is reluctantly stepping toward the house, sighs in relief and hangs back. Great idea. Do be careful, ladies. Come on, Carter, I'll race you. They run off giggling like schoolgirls, and Ellie shakes her head, takes a wee nip from her flask, offers it to me. I take a sip gratefully, the sting of the harsh alcohol rising up in my sinuses and warming my stomach. Those two are wimps, Ellie says. Come on, I reply, surging forward emboldened by the drink. Let's see what's what. The front door is conveniently unlocked. I have no idea why I thought it would be, but am relieved to find it so. The house itself is empty. No one has been here or lived here in quite some time. Not weeks, not months, years. It has an abandoned air. A thick coating of dust lies on all the tables in the foyer. We leave footprints as we make our way in. Who would just leave a place like this? Ellie wonders aloud. Her voice rings in the hallway, and the house seems to sigh in relief. Someone is home. It doesn't like being deserted. It is a place to laugh and to love, to be cherished, not to be left alone with an encroaching wood and an empty cave. I don't realize I am speaking out loud until Tess says, you speak like it has feelings, Rebecca. It's just an old house. I clear my throat. You know me, always spinning stories. I can't see a cloud without wanting to write its tale. You really are weird, she replies fondly and wanders toward the stairs. I take the left parlor. Ellie takes the right. The furniture sits uncovered. Mice have taken up residence in the damask chairs. Birds in the fireplace chimney a scattering of feathers blow on the marble. The thought of birds trapped in the chimney brings back my strange dream and I shudder. I do not like dead things. Through the formal parlor is a ballroom. I feel like I am spying on a moment in time, frozen in amber, unchanging all these years. It was clearly a grand ball. The vestiges are left, champagne flutes on the mantles, as if their owners were called away to dance and left them forgotten in the detritus of the party. Silver trays now darken to black with bits of ancient mold stuck to them balance on small tables. A grand piano stands open with four other seats to its right. A cello, two violins, and a harp sit abandoned. It is as if the party ended. All the people left mid-dance, disappearing entirely, including the servants and the owners. Rebecca, let's get out of here. I'm getting creeped out. Ellie is standing at my elbow, whispering to me, and I nod. I'm getting creeped out, too. Where's Tess? Here. She is standing on the opposite side of the room, holding something in her hands. What do you have there? A guest book. The last entry is from 1929. Seems like there was a big party. Everyone's name is listed. The Rookwoods, the Wrights, the O'Connells, the Archers, the Bouchers. It goes on and on. There must have been a hundred people here for this party. The paper is old and crumbling. I take a photo of the pages so we won't disturb it more. It's so strange, isn't it? Something clearly happened to everyone. Something wicked happened here, Ellie says. It feels all wrong. There must be something in the papers about it. We can look it up when we get home. Come on, let's bolt. This place is giving me the willies. As we are walking to the front door, a portrait in the hallway catches my eye. There are several portraits in a row, the family clearly. 
but only one holds the visage of a woman with cat eyes and wiry gray hair. Looking at her, I can almost feel her breath on my face. She seems so alive, so annoyed to be stuck in the painting, like she wants to walk out of the house with us, to be free. I don't realize I've stopped in my tracks until the girls beckon me, and with a last glance at the woman who saved the valley from the wind, I go with them gladly, closing the door gently behind me. That night we decide to go out to dinner. I think everyone feels disconcerted by the story we bring back from the house and want a moment to connect with the real world. The restaurant is ten minutes away, on top of the rise, with a view of the valley below. It is a barbecue joint, and the smells of hickory and vinegar permeate the air of the parking lot and make my mouth water. It feels odd to be back in civilization. Though we've only been gone two days, we've become accustomed to the quiet rhythm of the lakeside cottage. It has a magical air around it, a perfect spot for creatives. We've all been riding up a storm, and now it's time to celebrate, and maybe check our email, or even do a quick bit of research on who belonged to the lost house in the woods. Both prove fruitless to me. I have a few emails, but nothing of import. And I can't find anything about the house. The food is delicious, though, and we eat until our sides creak and drink two bottles of wine. I steer clear after the first glass. I'll have more when we get back to the house. Someone has to see us safely home. When the waitress comes over to hand out the checks, Ellie asks what we've all been wondering about. Are you familiar with the history of this area? Well, sure. Y'all visiting? I only want to stab out her eyes for a moment. Clearly we are strangers and as such are visiting, but I refrain. We're in a cabin nearby for a few days. Ah, girls weekend, she says with a knowing smile, and I don't correct her. I don't like strangers knowing my business. There's a big abandoned house across the lake from our cabin. Do you know anything about it? Carter asks, her words a challenge. The old Atwood place? We're silent. We don't know what it's called. It's abandoned, she adds helpfully. That's the one, Ellie says, and I hear the laugh she's biting back. Do you know anything about it or the people who used to live there? The waitress has been friendly until now, but her face grows wary. The Atwoods, they owned all the land in this town. Used to be mill owners, I think but they all left decades ago. Who owns the house? I ask. I don't know. No one really goes up there. It's kind of scary, and it's private property. I wouldn't want to get caught snooping around. A man I take to be her boss walks by at that exact moment, giving her a hurry-up look. A line has begun to form outside. The chairs in the restaurant's porch and foyer are full, a popular place the only restaurant on top of the mountain, I suspect. When he turns away, she gives us a pasted-on grin. Yeah, I'll have fun with your computers. Come back and see us. It's not until we are searching again for the drive-in that I realize what she said. We never said anything about working or writing. I can't shake the eerie feeling that parades down my spine. They are watching us. The Atwoods. The name rings a bell with Carter, who is our resident historian. The small cabin has a small library, which she took apart the day we arrived. And there is a little book on the area that she found the first night. She pulls it off the shelf, sits at the battered kitchen table, and reads, The Atwoods made their money logging the mountains around here, she announces, pushing her glasses up on her nose and taking a sip of wine. The family settled in Rising Fawn in the 1800s. They were carpetbaggers from Maine originally, drawn down to the south by the promise of large tracts of land and good prices on the logging, caused all sorts of a stir when they bought the mountain and built their house. Maybe they were tired of being cold in the winter? Can you imagine Maine in the 1800s, 
Brr, Ellie says, shivering. She pours us each another glass of wine. I've lost count now, but it is our last night, and we're planning to sleep in and clean the cabin in the morning instead of working, then get on the road by early afternoon. I am pleasantly tipsy. Does it say what happened to them? Tess calls from the kitchen, where she is manhandling open another bottle with a wine key. Nope. Carter flips a few more pages. Worthless piece of crap book. All it says is that the house has been kept in trust since the 30s, and the whereabouts of the family remains a mystery. Tess cracks the bottle. We hear her giggling and saying, Oops. Then she appears in the door, wavering slightly, the bottle clutched in her hand. Francie takes it from here. We'll just have to do some more research on it when we get back, I guess. Who wants to watch a movie? The mysterious house is forgotten, then, as we sail away to lands unknown on the back of a rider we all admire. But I can't help myself. Ten minutes in, I get up and draw all the curtains in the house. A storm rattles through overnight. Rattles, literally. We are under a tin roof, and the acorns fall from the trees with a clatter, waking everyone up. They sound like gunshots, and we cower, laughing nervously as they ping and pong off the roof. Lightning flares and the lights flicker. Make a fire, I tell Carter, who listens without arguing for once. We don't want to be left in the dark entirely. The moment the flames go up, the lights go out, and Carter gives me a thankful look. We look for candles, find a few, line them up on the table. No one can sleep now. The wind and rain are howling, howling up from the valley, and I can't help myself. Chills crawl up and down my arms. That wind feels familiar. It feels malevolent. We huddle together in front of the fire, hoping for the lights to come back on. I debate telling them about my dream, about the wind and the cave, but decide against it. I fear I will manifest something if I speak it aloud. It's one of the reasons I never speak my dreams. Maybe I should have talked more to the palm reader all those years ago. As it is, all I do is write them down and pray death does not come knocking. We huddle together, telling jokes and stories. Eventually, Ellie admits her secret and the rest of the night is passed in drunken anger toward a woman we all love. But we'll side with Ellie. She is ours. Fuck Vera. We wake early by the still warm ashes of the fire. The electricity remains out, which means no way to run the dishwasher or clean the sheets and towels. Everyone is exhausted. I am in favor of packing up and paying the fine for leaving the house as is, but I am overruled. In a huff, I take another early morning walk. The lake seems so much less ominous when the sun is out. I want to go to the cave again, but I can't find the sign. The storm must have knocked it down. Standing on the edge of the lake, I realize much of the thicket has been cleared out. The grass is lying flat against the still steaming earth. The landscape looks different. I can see small gray lumps in the distance. I find the graveyard in a squashed copse beside the lake. The Atwoods are heavily represented, but there are other names, older names, names that match the guest book we found in the house. I wander quietly until I see a grave with a gothic marble angel perched on top. Charlize Eleonora Atwood 1898 to 1929. Beloved. C. Atwood. Catwood. The word we screamed in my dream at the mouth of the missing cave. This must be the woman from the portrait. She was a great woman. The voice comes from my right, and I startle like a hare from the brush. The waitress from last night is standing on the edge of the cemetery. She is wearing shorts and running shoes, her long brown hair done up in a ponytail, earbuds in. Out for a run? I ask, proud that my voice only wavers slightly. Day off. Finally. I've been stuck pulling doubles all week, 
Hey, sorry if I was rude the other night. I couldn't tell you more about the Atwood house. My boss doesn't like us talking about it. He's worried people will start gathering again like they did the last time. He's an O'Connell, you see. The last time? O'Connell? Devin O'Connell was Charlize's betrothed. They never got a chance to marry. Their daddies hated each other and wouldn't consent to the match. So they ran off together, and a year later, Charlize came home alone, pregnant, looking like she'd been through a war. Only 20, but her hair was as gray as my granny's. She would never say what happened, would never tell where Devin was. The families were already at odds. It drove a spike right through them. Legend has it the Atwoods threw a party, a big party to welcome her home. And the O'Connells showed up en masse to find out once and for all what happened and killed every one of them Atwood folk. Good God, that's horrible. It surely was. Charlize, she got away, they say. Managed to hide out in a cave somewhere up on the land up around here. Had her baby in secret by herself. She wandered alone, raised that baby, sent her off into the world, then lay down and died. How sad. The girl looks into the distance, shading her eyes. She was touched in a way. When she came back, some say she had the sight. Some say she could talk to ghosts. I don't know the real truth, but whatever happened that night, after the massacre, there were no bodies. All the Atwoods disappeared, along with everyone at that party. A whole community gone. No one knows what happened. Only a few people from the family survived. The children who were home with their nannies while their parents died and disappeared. This whole place is populated by strangers now. She spits out the word and I feel strongly as if an arrow has been shot into my heart. If everyone disappeared, where did they go? She shakes her head, plays with the cord of her earbuds. I don't know. No one knows. The wind took them. That's what the legend says, but that's silly. Old wives' tale. You have a good day. Be safe getting back up to Nashville, you hear? She starts to jog away, but I yell. Wait! She stops, jogging in place. If there aren't any bodies, why is there a graveyard? She shrugs. Gotta honor the dead somehow. Besides. And she grins. You never know who might come along to tend it. I try to make sense of this tale as I hurry back to the cabin. This is the second time that girl has said something about us we haven't shared and I am damn good and ready to get out of here as quickly as possible. The bucolic pond has suddenly become alive and hateful, and I fear we are not safe. I shouldn't have gone to the cave. We shouldn't have gone into the house. My dreams are letting in something old, something evil, and I must stop it. I must stop them. They are watching. They are waiting. I round the last curve and realize the path has been washed out. I am forced to turn around, go back the way I came, toward the running girl and the graveyard. The idea fills me with so much dread, I decide to cut across the marshy thicket, knowing if I head toward the sun, I will run into the cabin. But I am disoriented. And as the reeds part in front of me, I realize I have gone in a circle and have ended up back at the cave. Rebecca. A gentle mother's voice calls, the words a whisper on the wind. Come and see. The rushes begin to move, the breeze settling in, the updraft from the valley below growing stronger. I am powerless against it. My feet move without my consent. The maw opens to welcome me back, and I begin to shake. I am inside now, deeper than before. The light flickering on my phone. The smell is different, rancid, wrong. I know it's only mud kicked up by the storm, by the rain, by the wind. But something is stirring in my primordial brain, and I stumble. I go down hard on both knees, falling forward into the muck. I land awkwardly. Something juts into my ribs, and the pain makes me lurch to the side. I see the faces then, 
the skulls, the mouths agape, the bones of their lost bodies white in the darkness. The family is here. The Atwood family is inside the cave. The rising water has unearthed their bones. The wind can't get them anymore. I run until I can run no more. I am covered in mud and muck in the dust of a nearly century-old grave. I still have no real idea what happened in the cave, how I have manifested this horror. But if I can make it back to the lake, make it back to the girls, all will be forgiven. We will leave and never come back. The girl is standing in the trees. She has approached silently, sneaking up behind me. When she steps from behind the trunk of the ash, I no longer see the modern running shorts and bra top, nor earbuds, but an odd black dress, a braid, the glint of silver eyeglasses, all in a blur, because she scares me and I run. It's the only reasonable thing to do, considering there is a strange woman approaching me. I run as fast as I can toward the house. The girls will save me. The girls will shelter me. You there. You, girl, stop. What are you doing? That woman needs help. What have you done? My God, is she? She stops her pursuit to stare into the lake. It's a trick, my mind says. Keep running. But I look back once, in time to see her face clearly in the reflection of the lake light. Her face changes, brows coming together as if she's just had a thought. It is shaded in blue. And then she smiles. And I feel the wind begin to stir beneath her hands. Shit! Oh, this is not good! Not good at all! I am fast! But she runs me down easily, her feet pounding on the hard earth behind me, closer and closer, until I am down in the dirt on my knees, and she rolls on top of me, breathing heavily. Stop fighting. This is your destiny. You have to come with me. Mother wants you. On the ridge, I see her, standing, arms up, as if she is beckoning me home. Catwood, I whisper. Charlize smiles benevolently, and her words float down from the hill. You are chosen. You are one of us. My face is in the water before I can draw a breath. The girl holds me there until I can see the small things crawling in the mud below. Small silver fish come to explore my nose, my mouth, my eyes and ears. And then I am adrift. The fear and horror have fled. It is a beautiful place, green and gold and silver. I love looking at the microcosm. It is like the cave, but wet and willowy. When I am fully relaxed, the girl helps me from the water. And together, side by side, we march up the hill to protect the land below. From a distance, I hear my friends crying, calling, and one voice above the rest, Ellie, shrieking my name over and over, as if I am a lost dog. I glance back over my shoulder as we walk away. Ellie is pulling the body from the water. My body. Why did it have to be her who found me? She will never recover from this. She will always blame herself. My friends gather on the muddy bank, crooning my name, speaking as one. A chant being taken up by the hillside, and the crickets and the birds and the frogs, and the wind catches the tune and whistles along. It starts as one word, then becomes another, one more sibilant, more cunning, more familiar to the fallow fields. Rebecca! Catwood! Rebecca! Catwood. Rebecca. Catwood. This is J.T. Ellison. People ask me all the time where I get my ideas. Well, Catwood is a totally meta story for me. A couple of years ago, I went on a writer's retreat in the North Georgia mountains with a group of friends. The cabin was perfectly situated on a small pond with a dock. The moment we arrived, 
We arrayed ourselves on that silent dock, stretching from the long car ride, then basking in the sun, staring idly at the water, chatting about our upcoming work. A story came to me right then, and I threw the bones of it together the moment I touched my laptop. The story was, of course, about a group of writers who go to a cabin in the woods with a pond and a dock, and while there, find a body floating in the water. I know. It's terrible of me to be thinking about dead bodies floating in ponds while sitting enjoying one, but that's how my brain works. I tuck the idea away for a rainy day, and then dead ends happened, and I enjoyed the process of seeing my friends' stories come to life so much that I wanted to join in. I decided to write the story about the body in the pond. While I was thinking about it, I had an incredibly bizarre dream. I was standing in a cave with Margaret Atwood, and she was screaming at the wind. Her screams were the only thing keeping us alive. And then a huge flock of birds dropped dead at her feet, and the wind ceased to blow. All the symbolism of that dream aside, I knew I had my tail. I stitched the dream and the pond imagery together with the photo of the house I'd given my authors, and Catwood was born. I hope you enjoyed it. Grey Lady Lady Grey. The corridor was empty. A small mouse nibbled in a corner, whiskers covered in dust, his grey fur nearly translucent in the dark. Preparations were being made below. She could hear them, scurrying, simpering, slutting. Wood brought in for the fireplaces, which meant the attics would become unbearably hot as the warmth rose from floor to floor. Winter flowers and deep Scottish weeds tended in the gardens outside, what was left of them anyway. Balustrades polished, floors washed and waxed, carpets vacuumed, bedding changed. A wedding, if her long ears didn't deceive her. A chance. The lips on her decrepit face pulled back from long, taloned teeth into a semblance of a grin. Dolon, she called, delighting in the fright it gave the cook five floors below, who heard the wind whistling through her kitchen and smelled the odour of sulphur on the breeze. He appeared before her, summoned by her use of his name. Yes, Lamia. What have you been doing? Eating the late lambs. They are so succulent this time of year. She looked closer. Her vision wasn't what it once was, and saw the little bits of flesh hanging from his beard, the grey stained black with blood. Blood. Blood on the corner of his mouth. With sight came smell, the rising odour forcing her to salivate like a rabid dog. Her loins throbbed. Come here, my sweet... He obeyed, and she flicked a long, pointed tongue around the edges of his mouth, catching flesh and blood and the musk. He'd eaten the lambs from the ass first, the beast. Just that little bit of essence was enough. Dolon became solid in front of her. A handsome man, Dolon. Simple, driven by needs not unlike her own. Banished to this castle at birth, forced to grow up under Lamia's tutelage. She loved him in the only way she knew how to love, which was filled with hate and fear and loathing and manipulative desperation. That was lovely, darling. Now you must do something for me. It seems we have visitors arriving. Yes, I saw. They will have to go to the next farm for the Lamshanks. He laughed uproariously, his joke so simple, so crude, just like Dolon. She ran her fingers along the slick flesh of his forearm. Pretty, please pay attention. What is your wish, my lady? Her tongue curled around her mouth. Bring me all the information, Dolon. 
leave nothing out. Elizabeth wanted to be a princess. From the time she was five and grasped the concept of the Cinderella myth that any woman could capture the heart of her own Prince Charming, she set herself on the journey to become a princess. She didn't seek a royal throne. No, that was best left to those who would squabble over the scraps and look cross-eyed down their long, nebbish noses at lesser beings like her. She didn't want a crown. Elizabeth sought the only real path to princessdom. She sought true love. And she'd found it in the form of a wonderful man named Edgar, who looked at her with sunshine and roses in his eyes. They'd met at a softball game of all places, opposing teams. She was sweaty and covered in dust from the pitching mound and a long slide into third. He was sweaty and covered in the dust she kicked up when she slid. They emerged from the cloud, coughing and laughing. He'd helped her to her feet, and she'd been lost. Gone. He had blue eyes that sparkled and a strong jaw not to mention legs like tree trunks and an ass that would make a grown woman cry. He knew how to use it, too. His voice was soft and melodious and had never been raised in anger toward her. Edgar was an infinitely patient man, one who would bite his lip and walk to another room if she were ever shrill or annoyed, which wasn't often. He gave her no reason to seek connubial combat. Edgar, quite simply, made her happy. So when he'd asked her to marry him, down on one knee, a clear, glistening stone nestled in a bed of gold and hand extended, she hadn't hesitated. Within weeks they decided to have the wedding in Scotland, at a castle, to fulfil Elizabeth's lifelong quest. Only princesses married in castles, after all. Elizabeth stood in the parking lot outside the castle keep and raised her hand to her eyes, blotting out the sun. It had been cloudy and rainy since they landed in Edinburgh, but the moment she'd arrived at the estate, the sun had boldly forced its way into the sky, as if it too wanted a piece of her happiness. It was too bright now, she stepped to her left so the tower of the castle could help block the incessant rays. Something moved behind the highest window, the breeze picked up, and Elizabeth's sullen brown hair whipped into a frenzy, then fell limp against her ears. She felt odd, filled with longing, her pulse beating hard between her legs. She wanted to bed Edgar now. She blushed and felt her breath come fast. Edgar, did you see that? See what, dear? Elizabeth focused on the window again and saw nothing. She let her breath regulate. Nerves. It was just nerves. She'd been a bundle for days now. The pressure of the trip, the planning, the knowledge she would be binding her life to his forever. It all had her on edge. The sun is playing tricks on me, I suppose. Shall we go in? A small party had been planned as a surprise for Edgar and Elizabeth. Unbeknownst to them, their wedding attendants had all flown over a day early to have things prepared. When they entered the long corridor to the castle keep, the hall was lined with white roses and bedecked with ribbons, and a small white sign with a hand-drawn arrow pointing down the hall read, this way. It was quite fetching, and Elizabeth commented as such to Edgar, who agreed, though he was quite preoccupied with their baggage at that moment, and was startled when Elizabeth screamed in delight. Hands grabbed at them, parents, friends, sisters and brothers, hugging and kissing and showering the couple in rose petals. Elizabeth cried prettily, and Edgar was also moved. To have such love surrounding you was something to treasure, and Edgar wasn't the kind to dismiss strong emotion when it overcame him. He handed Elizabeth the tissue and took one for himself, 
Once they were done with the tears, they were ushered into an intimate dining room, seated in the middle of the long, grand table, looking toward the window that spread the gardens before them like a fertile green blanket and tucked in to a light lunch. Elizabeth simply glowed, and Edgar couldn't resist leaning into her begonia-scented aura and slipping in a kiss. The crowd cheered and clicked their forks against their champagne flutes in thrilled response. Edgar deepened the kiss, letting his tongue touch hers. So warm, so wet, so perfect. God, he loved this woman. He wanted her. His mind saw her splayed face down in front of him, legs spread, wide and pink and moist and wanting. He felt a quick breath of air, fetid and warm at his right ear, and opened his eyes a fraction. He was a rational man. His mind didn't allow him to see the bearded face, twisting slowly two inches from his own, dark skin rippling with maggots and roaches. His mind allowed him to feel momentarily uneasy, as if something were watching him, or a goose had walked over his grave. But he dismissed the smell as old meat left in the sun and put another arm around Elizabeth. When they broke free, accompanied by hoots and hollers, the castle staff filtered in, and their wedding planner gave them the schedule for the following two days. Edgar did his best to pay attention. Dolon mounted the stairs slowly. He knew what was waiting for him. Lamia was once a beautiful, cunning woman, sought after by men across realms, but she had become something less than real, something full of hate and spite. He didn't blame her, not really. He was simply annoyed that he was tied to her forever. All grey ladies were assigned a demon, for they were unable to leave their earthly rooms without a demon's escort and needed something that could travel through the air, move through walls, lift into the breeze and delve into the souls that fed her existence to make that happen. It was just... Lamia was so old. Even when she received the essence, became the glorious woman she once was, even then he knew that she was crinkled up like an old parchment inside... It interfered with his abilities. It truly did. He reached the top of the stairs and slid through the wooden door into her rooms. She was asleep in her chair, facing the fire, a fur throw around her shoulders. Her grey skin sagged, and a fine line of spit dripped from her sharp, hollow teeth. At least she still had them. He stood for a moment, repulsed, she would be furious with him for watching her sleep. He slipped back through the door and made some noise in the hall, a warning to wake her. When he moved through the door again, she'd straightened in the chair. The fur throw was in her lap now, and she was smiling at him. Her cataracts made her eyes the colour of sludge. What news, must wait? A wedding, Lamia, just like you thought between two very young, very impressionable beings. You should have seen the female when you called to her. She turned red in the face like a baboon's ass. And him, my love, he is strong, but also susceptible. We have a chance. Lamia leapt briskly from her seat and went to the window. When is the ceremony? Tomorrow night, seven. We should have enough time. Yes, we will. Lamia turned back from the window to face him, and Dolon could see the vestiges of the beauty she had once been. Even she, old and cruel and severe, could be transformed by joy. We will. The dress Elizabeth wore was simple and elegant. The base had been her grandmother's, a wide, bell-shaped skirt of thick satin. The bodice and lace were current additions, 
making the dress modern and sophisticated. It had a cathedral-length train, and though it was much too long for their purposes in the small castle chapel, shortening it was a concession she refused to make. Princesses had cathedral trains. She swished about in the heavy skirt, feeling the slick fabric mould to her legs. She was rapturously happy. She checked off the list in her head. She was in a castle. She was about to marry the most wonderful man alive. She was wearing part of her grandmother's wedding gown, which brought her back to life in a way. She looked beautiful. Her skin was clear. She didn't have her period. Her dress fit like a glove. Even her hair had gotten in line and was piled on her head in glorious waves. That was plenty for one girl's wedding day, she thought. There was rustling in the antechamber. Lizzie, it's time. Are you ready? Her father. Tears pricked her eyes. Oh, my God. Her whole life she'd been waiting for this moment. And now, here it was. She took a deep breath. Ready, Daddy. She opened the door and admired her handsome father, resplendent in his white tie and tails. He twitched a bit, uncomfortably humbled by the scrutiny. You look gorgeous, Daddy. So do you, my dear. Shall we get you married off? Remember, it's right foot first. There were forty-nine stairs. She counted each and every one as they went down. The castle was decorated to the nines. She wondered which mice had descended upon the rooms to make it happen. Before she had a chance to think anything more, the planner handed her the flowers, a simple spray of white roses and hydrangea, then opened the doors to the chapel. It all went very quickly from there. The trumpet voluntary sprang to life. Her guests rose to their feet, and she saw Edgar, standing at the other end of the room. It was all she could do to not break free and run to him, to throw herself in his arms. She floated down the aisle to gasps of appreciation. She attributed the crawling, goosebumpy sensation running down her spine to nerves. She couldn't see the two uninvited guests standing at either side of the altar, waiting for her with blood risen. Her father stopped walking, so she stopped as well. Edgar looked ready to cry. She fought the urge as well. Words, words, words. Her father squeezed her hand, and then it was time. The priest was a homely man with wads of white hair spilling from his ears. Mwawaj. She stifled a giggle. He spoke in a clear bell voice that snapped her back to sober. Elizabeth, will you have this man to be your husband, to love together in the covenant of marriage? Will you love him, comfort him, honour him, and keep him in sickness and in health, and, forsaking all others, be faithful to him as long as you both shall live? I will. Elizabeth brushed a single tear from the corner of her eye. The priest turned slightly with a rustle of cloth as dark as a raven's wings. Edgar, will you have this woman to be your wife, to live together in the covenant of marriage? Will you love her, comfort her, honour and keep her, in sickness and in health, and, forsaking all others, be faithful to her? as long as you both shall love. Edgar's voice carried to the back of the hall. I will. While all of you witnessing these promises do all in your power to uphold these two persons in their marriage, there was a chorus of confidence. We will. Elizabeth glowed. It's time, Lamia whispered. Their fidelity has been pledged. The moment is ours. Go, Dolon, go! He disappeared from Edgar's side. It was easier for Dolon. 
As a demon, he was built to enter the host seamlessly. Lamia, on the other hand, was forced to choke down a potion whose recipe was of unknown origin, one that she'd gotten the chance to make only four times in her existence. She unstoppered the bottle and dropped the contents on her tongue. It was most powerful. Only three drops were needed. She swallowed quickly before the taste of soot and hellfire registered fully and shut out the voices of the consecrated blood spilled for her formulary that screamed in her head. She willed it, willed herself into the body of the girl, into the sweet nothingness that resided in the girl's blood. She was getting smaller, her features softening, her hair growing and weaving onto her head her nails shortening, her skin smoothing, her eyes clearing. And then she opened her conscious being and stared into a blue abyss with a slight brownish cast over it. She felt the girl kicking against her liver, drowning in the bile of her body, crying out for release. It had worked. Lamia resisted the urge to lick her lips, her tongue was very long. It might look wrong. Less than ten hours. That's all she needed. Edgar took her hand. In the name of God, I, Edgar Allen Gray, take you, Elizabeth, to be my wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish until we are parted by death. This is my solemn vow. Speak, Lamia. It's your turn. Her voice was astonishing, pure and only slightly wavering. In the name of God, I, Elizabeth Banks Morton, take you, Edgar, to be my wedded husband, to have and to hold from this day forth, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish until we are parted by death. This is my solemn vow. Lamia smiled serenely, and a small red tear formed in the corner of Elizabeth's right eye. The officiate blessed the rings. There were more words. A single gold band was slid onto her finger, and Lamia felt the power of the metal course through her. She knew she was shimmering, feeding upon this. The love Edgar had for Elizabeth, it was powerful and good. If she could just make the dawn, sleep and awake in the body of the child, the transmogrification would be complete. When by the power vested in me through the Lord our God, I now pronounce you husband and wife. The priest leaned in and said quietly, You may kiss your bride. Dolon's face flashed through for an instant, a leering grin. Then Edgar was back, solemn and steady. He leaned in slowly, savouring the moment, staring into Lamia's eyes. His lips pressed to hers, and the flood of innocence brought blood to her tongue. To the dawn she whispered. Edgar looked surprised for a moment, then smiled knowingly. To the dawn, he replied. A cheer went up as they turned to face their new world as husband and wife. The party went on into the wee hours. Neither Edgar nor Elizabeth seemed to be in any hurry to get to their marriage bed. Instead, choosing to dance and carry on. Their friends and family loved it. Seeing their son and daughter, their buddies let loose, the pressures of the wedding behind them was just the ticket. The alcohol flowed, the music took on maniacal proportions, going faster and faster until the band members themselves seemed to melt from the sweat pouring off their bodies. Yet they continued to play louder and quicker and more insistent. Bridesmaids found themselves in dark corners with groomsmen they'd never before found attractive, 
rolling with wave after wave of orgasm as they were penetrated with all manner of appendages and penises. The whole castle thrummed with a primal rhythm, the bodies and heartbeats bumping in time to the music. When the music stopped, they didn't even notice. Edgar even took a quick turn in the bathroom with one of the waiters and was thoroughly amused when Elizabeth walked in on them and slapped his hand in response. But at three in the morning, after watching the Bacchanalian with an emotion bordering on contentedness, Elizabeth edged up to Edgar and said, We must go. They left the wedding party writhing in ecstasy and mounted the stairs. No one noticed them leaving. This was the tricky part. There were so many conditions on the spell, so many different ways it could go wrong. Lamia and Dolon needed to exit the bodies they possessed and consecrate the marriage, each to the other, Elizabeth to Dolon, Edgar to Lamia. A very intense glamour was needed to make their appearance deceptive enough. Then each must sleep for one hour in the arms of their lover, and as the dawn broke the sky, the transformation would be complete. Lamia would become Elizabeth, mortal for a time. For all time. Lamia into Elizabeth was the most important. Dolon into Edgar was somewhat of a moot point. Dolon could inhabit Edgar any time he wanted. Dolon, as a demon, could enter bodies and exit them, be them, whenever he pleased, but he was doomed to his fate. Nothing, nothing would change him from a demon to a human. But Lamia, having been cast into the role of Grey Lady nearly fifteen centuries earlier, had a real chance at escape. She had to trust that Dolon would uphold his end of the bargain. She knew he didn't love her but she thought he'd want to be rid of her more than he wanted to take revenge on her for his plight. But demons, they were hard to predict, and Dolon was a stubborn bastard at best. Lamia tried to focus on the situation at hand and not worry about what might happen later. She'd only had four other chances like this in hundreds of years, and she wanted this to go smoothly. So far... Edgar and Elizabeth had proved malleable and perfectly willing to be hosts. She didn't pray any more, but felt a small part of her being lifted up. But first, they needed two separate rooms and impeccable timing. They'd spent the day creating the identical bridal suites, one on either side of the castle. Dolon was quite handy with the details. She'd never known him to have a flair for decorating before. If this didn't work... The stairwell was dark. Dolon had unscrewed all of the electric light bulbs. Alcohol would only make their hosts so blind. Darkness was needed as well. Edgar and Elizabeth moved as one up the stairs, the remnants of their possession making them compliant. At the very top... Fear began to emanate from one of them. No, Lamia whispered. A shimmering glow filled the air. Lamia felt the sweetness that was Elizabeth cover her like a gossamer blanket. The glamour was in place. Dolon winked at her as he shimmered into Edgar, taking Elizabeth's hand and pulling her toward the west bridal suite as Lamia pulled Edgar to her side and continued down the hall. Wait, Elizabeth said, but Lamia coughed and made Edgar walk faster. I can't wait to be with you, she whispered, running her hands around the front of his trousers. Edgar laughed, a throaty, drunken sound. Not going to last long, sweetheart. I think I've had a bit too much to drink. Lamia smiled her most feral grin. That's fine, darling. Once is all we need. Elizabeth woke just before dawn. She was horrendously sore between the legs. 
she blushed at the mere thought of the things they had done. As drunk as she'd been, she was willing to try most anything, and Edgar, Edgar had tried most everything. Oh, God, she had a horrible hangover. Bile rolled in her stomach, her head pounded, but she'd had the strangest dream. Her grandmother had come to her. She wanted her to drink salt water upon rising. The woman had been dead for twenty years. Elizabeth rarely dreamt of her. But when she did, she always knew to examine the dream, what fleeting bits she could remember of it, then think to whatever pressing question had been weighing on her mind. Dreams of her grandmother signalled a decision would be made. Sometimes, when she didn't even know she was struggling with a question, salt water, yuck. But she'd learned never to question, only to do. She went into the bathroom, looking for a glass. Her grandmother had been a wise woman. Maybe there'd be salt on the table. Edgar, curled in the bed behind her, looked exactly like hell. His skin was tinged with green, his hair spiked to one side of his face. He even looked like his beard was growing in. That was strange. Edgar wasn't a heavily furred man. She spared him one last glance, then went to the window. She heard waves crashing. She hadn't realised the beach was so close. The castle perched on the edge of a cliff, with a long, rickety staircase leading down to the rocky beach below. In the waves, she saw a man swimming. It looked like... No, that couldn't be. It looked like Edgar. But Edgar was in the bed behind her, wasn't he? A strange pool began in her stomach. She heard a voice calling her name. Elizabeth, come to me. She held her hand up in front of her face. It was transparent, clear with the morning sun. She could see directly through her forearm and hand to the sill below. The pull grew stronger. Panicked, she turned to call for Edgar, but there was no one there. She was alone in the room. She fought her way to the window again, breath coming hard in her throat. There were two men swimming below now, one riding the back of the other in the waves. They were body surfing, two men, together as one. As she watched, they caught a wave and rowed it in to the beach, then clambered out of the water. The man was Edgar. The man attached to him was Edgar too. Her breath began to fail. She didn't know what was happening. Come to me, Elizabeth. Come now. The voice called again, summoning. She had no control. She looked in the mirror and saw only a wisp of herself as she vanished into thin air. She was gone. Edgar was exhilarated. He didn't know what possessed him to drag out of his warm bridal bed and go swimming in the cold surf, but he was glad he had. It cleared his head. He felt wonderful, starving, in fact, and wanted to see Elizabeth. He wanted to see his wife now. He grabbed the towel and dried off briskly, then started back up the wobbly wooden stairs. He had so much energy so much power. My God, Elizabeth had done things to him he'd only read about. He had no idea she even knew those actions existed, saving it for the wedding night she was. He didn't think they'd gotten more than an hour's sleep. Then he woke to the note, My love, go for a swim, I'm getting us breakfast, and thought to himself, Yes, that's exactly what I'll do. I'll go for a swim. He bounded back to the castle, up, up the stairs to the bridal suite. He flung the doors open. Elizabeth was on the floor under a large grey mass. She wasn't moving, 
but the mass was sinuously sliding up and down Elizabeth's body. What is this? he demanded, completely uncertain what to do. There was a deep hissing noise, and he felt the room contract into coldness. Extreme fury pushed at his chest, making him fall back up against the wall. A breeze began, one that smelled like sulphur, whipping his hair and drying the last drops of salt from his arms, and he heard the words falling through the air like the hiss of daggers. Nolan, stop him! Edgar looked away from the writhing mass for a moment and saw himself standing on the far side of the room, arms crossed, a small grin on his face, enjoying the show. A small squeaking caught his attention. It was coming from Elizabeth. That thing was killing her. Edgar tossed a glance at his twin, then threw himself at the thing. He smelled himself on her, his sweat his semen, and realised he hadn't lain with his wife at all. The thought sickened him. The thing wailed and fought against him. It was like wrestling smoke. Punches and kicks were ineffectual. Elizabeth's squeaking grew fainter. With no full realisation of what he was doing, he stood and rushed at his twin. Edgar laughed at him, moving out of the way slightly as he drew near. How could this be? The real Edgar saw a mirror behind the thing that looked like him. Deviating at the last second, he ran smack into the mirror, causing it to shatter into a hundred pieces. He grabbed the largest from the floor and plunged back into the fray, stabbing at the grey thing with the shard. Elizabeth, I love you, he screamed. A deep, shrieking howl rose from the floor, and blood began to splash. Edgar slashed and slashed again, until his arm could raise no more, and his breath gave out. The scream was ear-splitting. The windows shattered, the walls began to shimmy. The bed rocked, and the wardrobe fell over. It was as if an earthquake had struck the room. Accompanied by cries of such intensity, Edgar felt himself going mad. And then it stopped. The silence was deafening. It took a moment for him to realise he wasn't moving, and another to feel the smallness beside him. Elizabeth! he cried. She was no longer translucent, but rosily painted in the thing's blood. Her eyes were closed and the parts of her skin that weren't red were deathly pale. They were alone in the room. He scrambled to his knees. Elizabeth, can you hear me? She moaned, and his rational mind took over. Blood. There was so much blood. It had to be hers. He was rough with her, pulling her body to and fro, until he found the shard of mirror wedged deep within her arm. Blood was pouring from the wound. It must have struck an artery. He needed a tourniquet. He grabbed the towel from the floor and wound it around Elizabeth's arm. She was going grey. Don't leave me, baby. Hang on. She opened her eyes. I love you. Her eyes lost their focus. He started CPR on her, fighting, pushing air into her lungs, pounding her chest. He didn't know how much time had passed. He just knew he couldn't give up. She's gone, you know. You can stop now. The voice startled him. He looked up and saw himself standing by the end of the bed. Only this version of himself wasn't covered in his love's blood. Who are you? My name is Dolon. What have you done with Elizabeth? Why did you kill her? I didn't. You did. You did a wondrous job of it, too. Just look at her, won't you? Edgar glanced down. Elizabeth's eyes were open. The blood was gone. She was breathing. 
The horrid open wound in her arm had closed. She started to sit up, and Edgar, lost, bent to help her. Edgar, what happened? She caught sight of Dolon, still looking like Edgar, and shook her head. I'm dreaming. Dolon changed forms, just to show them he could, then disappeared. Edgar rubbed his eyes. He knew he hadn't just seen what his mind said he saw. I don't know. Something is very wrong with this place. We need to get out of here, right now. Can you stand? I think so. Edgar, you were swimming, and my grandmother told me to drink a glass of salt water. I couldn't find the salt. I feel awful. Oh, God, hold on. She turned to her right and retched onto the floor. When she was able to stand upright again, Edgar searched her face. Elizabeth, what's wrong with your eyes? What do you mean? They've changed color. They're gray. She rushed into the bathroom and looked. He wasn't lying. Her beautiful brown eyes had turned a murky gray. I don't know what's going on, Edgar. Just get me out of here. He was backing away from her, a look of horror on his face. That thing, the thing that was eating you, it's inside you. Edgar, don't be silly. Elizabeth, you died. I saw it with my own eyes. I think, I think I killed you. Edgar, I'm very much alive. Look at me. I'm talking to you, aren't I? She was talking to him. But it wasn't her. He could tell. He could see the shadows of the woman he'd slept with last night, the details coming back to him in a rush. The teeth, long and pointed, the bat-like ears, the flesh hanging off her body, the vertebrae sticking out like armour. You, he said, voice hushed and terrified. Me, Lamia replied a perfect pink tongue caressing her new pink lips. Let's go home, husband. About the story I spent several months of 2010 researching and writing about a castle in Scotland. The castle itself was fictional, cobbled together from multiple visits into Scotland, brochures and obsessive googling of haunted castles, but it came alive for me on the page, as did its secrets. My castle, you see, was haunted. In the way of all haunted castles, there are multiple tales, legends, sightings, and horror stories that accompany the structure. In a country whose history is so bloody, it's fitting to have remnants and echoes of those battles seep onto the page, whether between hundreds on Culloden Moor or simply one-on-one. -on -one when bared, softly-skinned throats are slit in silent, stone-walled bedrooms. Are the legends true? Are the castle ghosts of Scotland real? All I know for sure is I would sprinkle salt across my threshold and along my window sills before I'd spend a night alone in Dulcie Castle. They say there is a grey lady who lurks in the attics. Her name is Lamia. The question is, who, exactly, is she? And what does she want with you? I'll never tell. The Endarkening Edinburgh, Scotland The missing poster was disconcerting. Evie saw it every day, twice a day, when she left for work and when she came home. It didn't matter what time it was, how drunk she was or wasn't, rain or shine, happy or sad. It was there, lurking, as if Bridget Wallace had stuck her own face to the pole with some sort of enchantment. The poster had been there for a year, a year of seeing the lost girl's face staring at her, the large centre shot abrupt and forward, eyes straight ahead as if she could see right through you, 
and the two smaller candids, one with a head thrown back laughing, another a profile shot from a fancy dress party. She was dressed as an angel. Evie thought that appropriate, considering the truth of the situation. Bridget Wallace was so similar to Evie Williams that it was almost as if she saw herself hanging there every day, captured in time, never changing, never aging, never found. Perhaps that's what drew her to the poster in the first place. Maybe it was the hashtag. Evie couldn't imagine having her own hashtag. Sections of it had faded, but the relevant information was readily apparent. Police appeal. Missing. Bridget Wallace. Hashtag find Bridget. Bridget was last seen 13 October 2016 near the Glasshouse Hotel in Edinburgh, 2 Greenside Lane, where she'd gone for drinks with friends. She is described as a white girl, aged 23, approximately 5 foot 3 inches, with long brown hair normally worn up in a ponytail and brown eyes. She is... We are keen to find her whereabouts and to hear if the public has any knowledge of her movements the night she disappeared. If you can help, please call. Reference MP number. Those details had long rubbed away. The white paper had aged to yellow. The edges were tattered. A large hole was ripped in the middle of the description of Bridget's looks. She is... What was Bridget? What little detail lived in that blank space? Was it the one clue that would lead to her discovery? Evie might have those details written down somewhere. When she first saw the poster, she followed the case religiously, even went online to the Missing People charity and read more about the girl in the chat rooms. But it had been nearly a year now, and it was clear to everyone Bridget Wallace wasn't coming home. Even the hashtag was no longer being used. No one was actively looking for or asking about her any more. Which led to now. Every day, twice a day, Evie felt guilty when she saw the poster. She should have done more. She should do more. She hadn't known Bridget Wallace, but it could just as easily have been Evie's face hanging on that pole. Evie went for drinks at the glass house sometimes. It was a cool place, artsy. Evie liked art, couldn't draw a lick, but liked looking at it. That's what had brought her to Edinburgh in the first place. An art history degree at the University of Edinburgh. She was a Nashville girl, brought up on Hatch show prints and the occasional exhibit at the Frist. There was art in Nashville, but nothing that compared to Edinburgh and its fantastic historical programs. She really liked her life right now. School was good. She had a lovely group of friends who teased her when she used their words in place of her own. Brolly, boot, hen party, all sounded silly and quaint out of Evie's mouth. She'd even developed the tiniest bit of a Scottish accent. It blended so nicely with her gentle southern drawl. Yes, she was happy here. All the time happy, except for the two five-minute periods twice a day when she stood by the poster, waiting for or getting off the bus, thinking as she always did of Bridget. For the longest time, people whispered Bridget had been taken by a serial killer, and Evie, utterly freaked out by this rumour, hadn't gone for drinks with anyone for a few weeks. Or for doing it, much, Eves, her friends teased. Thank you'll be next. She could be. Anyone could be. Think about it. At the time Bridget went missing, Evie lived alone. She could be eaten by her cat and no one would know unless they came round to check on her. Finally, realising she was being silly, she arranged for a flatmate. The incessant fear left her, and she started going out again. Time passed. The elements ripped holes in Bridget Wallace's description. Life became normal again. Evie's original level of concern seemed slightly hysterical. 
Now, when her friends suggested drinkies or an evening at an art exhibition, she was always the first to RSVP. She had plans this very evening for just such an event. They were in the first days of the Fringe, three weeks of high art in Edinburgh, so there were tons of new exhibits and instalments for Evie and her friends to attend. The exhibit in question was at the Dovecot, something about dark art from Scotland's past. The party would start in an hour. Evie had suggested the group come to her place for drinks first, then they'd head down to the Dovecot together. Everyone agreed. They were used to Evie's desire to move about town in a crowd, indulged her. Besides, she could afford better liquor and wine. They were all still on students' budgets, but Evie's parents paid her a healthy monthly stipend. She picked up two good Barolos and a nice Prosecco to start. She'd bought the cheese and meats on the weekend. It wouldn't take long to set up, but the Barolos needed to breathe, and she was running behind. She clambered off the too crowded bus, tried and failed to ignore Bridget, who, let's be honest, had become almost a friend in Evie's mind. The street was crowded with impartial strangers, and Evie was a small woman. They jostled her backpack and the brown paper bag she clutched that held the wine as she tried to cut her way through the stream to a front door. Couldn't they see her trying to cross the sidewalk and move down to Johnson Terrace where she lived? She did hate being invisible. It was the one thing that bothered her. She was working on it, making her personality bigger, brasher, louder, as if that would help her not seem so tiny and easy to miss. Sometimes it even worked. When she finally made it down to the close, a man was standing by the entrance to her building. He was cute, dark curly hair, blue eyes, rolled chinos and ankle boots, half preppy, half punk rock. She gave him a brief smile, and she opened the door, trying to shift the wine into the left arm with her purse so she could do the keypad to unlock the door. Let me, he said, reaching for the wine. Highlander, she thought, pulling it close. He had the deeper burr of the north in his speech. She was mildly pleased she could recognize it so easily, but totally freaked out, too. He was staring at her, and it was strange. I'm fine, thanks, I've got it. You're Evie, aren't you? Her heart pounded crazily, an adrenaline rush of fear barreling through her even as she thought, Goodness, he is handsome. How does he know my name? Oh, God, I'm in danger. He has a dimple on his chin. She realized he was still speaking. Of course you're Evie. I'm Thomas. Thomas McBean. I'm a friend of Ariel's. She invited me tonight. I'm a bit early. I came down from Inverness this afternoon and traffic wasn't as bad as I expected. Oh! She felt like such a goose. Always so on edge. That was Evie. It was just like Ariel to invite people over without telling Evie. I haven't gotten things ready, but you're welcome to come on up. Really, let me. And he took the wine with a big smile. Ariel said you were cute. She didn't do you justice. You're way beyond cute. She pulled open the door, rolled her eyes. I'm going to give you some of the good wine regardless. You don't have to try and flatter me. Good wine? I'm in. Lead the way. She liked the timbre of his voice and that ancient Scottish warrior accent. The city boys were much more anglicised than the northerners, who sounded like they'd just stalked off the battlefield, still holding their broadswords. Turn off your hormones, Evie. Thomas went directly to the windows, taking in the view. What a great flat! How'd you look into it? It was a great flat, modern and slick, with a lovely view of the castle, and she took great pride in it. She was grateful that she'd already cleaned the flat, and that her flatmate was gone to France on holiday, 
and the cat seemed to have hidden herself away so she wouldn't be yowling immediately, demanding Evie's undivided attention. Evie dumped her bags on the counter, accepted the wine from Thomas. She grabbed her wine key and started in on the Barolos. I looked forever before I left Nashville, and nothing suited me. The day before I was supposed to leave, this came on the market. I leased it sight unseen online, and have been very happy here. So you're lucky. Born under a star. I don't know about all that, but it is a nice place. Care for anything while I get ready? The look he gave her told her in no uncertain terms exactly what he'd care for. A long, slow, lazy smile appeared, and he crossed his arms. We have all night. Um, excuse me for a moment. Flustered, Evie went to her room, shut and locked the door. She stared into a mirror, saw the hectic spots of red on her cheeks. Damn it, she was blushing, and she looked terrible when she was all red-faced and embarrassed. She splashed some cold water on her face, brushed her hair and teeth, changed into a pair of velvet leggings and a tunic she knew set off her eyes, pulled on her tall brown riding boots, gave herself a little pep talk, and marched back into the kitchen. Thomas had found the cat, who was traitorously ribboning around his legs, meowing happily. That's James Madison. I didn't know he was a she until after the name stuck. I call her Maddie for short. She doesn't usually care for strangers. Thomas's eyes were grey, and held a hint of smoke in them. Aye, most cats don't like strangers but they usually take to me. He stood, stretched his back. Now, how about that wine? The friends arrived. The Barolos were a big hit, and Thomas stuck close by Evie's side, once even brushing a hand across her shoulders as he talked to the group. She felt warm and wanted. Ariel met Evie's eye for a few long, unspoken conversations, in which Evie sent silent thanks, and Ariel replied with a raised brow that said, I know, he's totally hot, you're welcome. After a successful cocktail hour, the whole merry crew headed to the dovecot. Evie was trying to play it cool with Thomas, but there was something about him. He was magnetic, she was drawn to him, and he seemed drawn to her. They walked together down the cobblestones, shoulders touching, and Evie couldn't help herself. She gave him a smile she knew was inviting, and felt to squeeze on her hand moments later. A promise, given and received. The gallery was stark white with blonde hardwoods. Some of the exhibit's paintings were dark, some light, but a large red painting immediately caught Evie's eye. At first glance it looked like a Rothko, a red rectangle on a black background. But as she drew closer, she saw it was by a Scottish artist named William Turnbull. She found the painting beautiful, yet restive, with its black and red swirling lines. The more she looked, the more uncomfortable she became. Thomas was standing to her right, leaning in to read the plate. She admired his jawline, then turned, flushed, toward the opposing wall. She gasped. The painting took up the entire wall from top to bottom. The canvas was black. On it, in graphic profile, danced a rotund white demon with a hooked bill for a nose and a single sooty black eye. It had one breast, the nipple tipped in silver, and what was supposed to be a smile cracked the head apart. The dance was macabre and gleeful. Evie could imagine the thing leaping right off the wall and grasping her hand, leading her in circles until she dropped from exhaustion. The very thought made the blood drain from her head. My God, it's grotesque! Thomas had an amused grin on his face. You think so? I do. It's 
horrible. There's great beauty and horror. I don't dispute that, but not in this piece. I can practically feel that thing reaching out of the canvas for me. Whoever painted it must be a seriously disturbed individual. Let's move on. Check in, Thomas said, but the tone was teasing and gentle, and she nodded. I am. I hate being scared, and that painting is downright scary. The whole exhibit is meant to be unsettling. It's called the Endarkenment for a reason. I guess Ariel didn't tell you what a wimp I am, then. She may have mentioned you spook easily. Edinburgh must be a hard place for someone like you. Whatever do you mean? The ghosts, of course. Can you not feel them when you walk the streets? The highlands are haunted, probably more so than the rest of Great Britain. And you're close. By God, I could feel them watching from the windows. Ah, I see. No, the ghosts don't normally bother me. They've been very welcoming. There is a weird noise in my apartment all the time. I've assumed it was a previous tenant. We're built on top of the old closes. Did you know they used to shut them off when the plague hit? No one was allowed in or out, and the people who lived there died in droves, either from the plague or starvation. I can't even imagine how terrible it must have been. He dipped his head in acknowledgement. Then it's reality that frightens you. Yes. People do terrible things to one another. I'm sensitive to it. Come, let's see the rest. As she stepped away, she could feel the lone eye of the dancing demon watching. There was nothing quite so horrid as the demon, but the rest of the art was still unsettling. There was a black snowman in a top coat, smoking a pipe in a snowy field, a man on his back being force-fed with a funnel, Kitsune foxes laughing in a tree, a huge canvas of painted shoes discarded outside the Holocaust ovens. Outside of the black and red painting she'd seen first, there was only one canvas she truly liked. That didn't make her itch to remove her skin and sit in boiling water. It was a white canvas with a billowy black slit traversing it like a gentle cloud. The blackness could be anything, a crevasse in a glacier, the inside of a broken bone, the space between two standing lovers. It reminded her of Georgia O'Keeffe, pudendal and erotic. Even though this painting was pretty, standing in front of it, Evie felt off balance, and the discomfort from earlier returned. Art was her refuge, her passion, but this whole exhibit made her jittery. The rest of the group were tipsy and loving every painting, creating dark stories to go along with them. Evie was desperate to leave. Every wall held another story, every sculpture a new tale. But no matter where she went, she couldn't seem to get completely out of view of the demonic dancer and its macabre smile. Thomas was attentive to her discomfiture and led her further into the gallery, where there were paintings and drawings that weren't part of the exhibit. He was attentive and kind, fetched her a bottle of water, sat with her and chatted. She didn't bother to hide her embarrassment. Somehow she knew he would understand and empathise. I'm sorry to be such a killjoy. Doesn't bother me. I don't know what's wrong with me. I love art. This stuff is just so dark. Why don't we get out of here? We could go for a drink next door while the rest of the group enjoys the show. That would be brilliant. Shall we? Evie couldn't leave the gallery fast enough. They went to a small pub two doors down. It was surprisingly quiet, polished brass and gleaming wood, and with a pint in front of her, Evie began feeling better, more herself. Thomas was witty and charming. When the group finally caught up with them, Evie was a bit drunk. Food was ordered, glasses tipped, the evening turned merry again, and the darkness and horror she'd felt was forgotten. 
On a trip to the loo with Ariel, Evie couldn't help herself. You must tell me, who is he? Thomas? I knew him in school, and in Inverness. Charming fellow, very sweet. Seems rather keen on you, Eves. I didn't know you were setting me up on a blind date. Oh, I wasn't. I thought the two of you might get along, is all. Reckon I was right. Well, yes, but he's from Inverness. It's three hours away. I can hardly do the long-distance thing. I think he's planning to move down. You should ask. Seriously, Evie, he's a good bloke. I had a bit of a crush on him myself when we were younger. I'm not his type, though. Considering Ariel was a knockout brunette with a body to match, Evie found that hard to believe. Ariel was everyone's type. What does he do? He's an appraiser, I believe. A buyer for one of the galleries in Inverness. That's why I thought you two would get along. He's quite interested in art. Thank you, Ariel. I appreciate you inviting him. She gave her friend a quick hug, and they went back to the raucous tables. Thomas smiled when he saw her, scooted over so she could sit. His hand brushed hers, and she felt that same warm flush begin. They were inseparable the remainder of the evening, and when the crowd broke up, Evie, knowing she should excuse herself and go home alone, instead invited Thomas back for a nightcap, because Ariel trusted him so thoroughly, and he'd been so incredibly kind and attentive, and the cat had liked him. So there was no way he could be anything but wonderful. And she was right. They'd barely made it inside the door when he kissed her, and more. The distraction Thomas provided was real and good, and they fell asleep entwined on her small bed in the wee hours of the night. A noise brought her to the surface, a long, high-pitched scrape on her bedroom window. She wrenched awake, heart pounding, but there was nothing but darkness and the gentle, deep breaths of the man next to her. She'd almost forgotten her earlier fear and discomfort. Almost. But while Thomas slept next to her, in the dark of her apartment, the image of the dancing demon came back, and the sound of faint scratching on her window lingered in her mind. She finally chalked it up to the ghosts who lived in the neighbourhood playing a joke, and went back to sleep. The following morning, Evie woke with a raging headache, lying next to the warm body of a practical stranger, refusing to acknowledge the moment of shame that coursed through her. She snuck to the bathroom, showered, and took two paracetamols. Her bed was now empty. She was surprised to find Thomas whistling in a kitchen, the kettle boiling. He'd pulled on his jeans, but left the top button undone. His hair was must, and she felt a wellspring of something. Don't even think the word love, Evie. Course through her. Is that tea? Good morning. It is. I found it in the cupboard. Scottish breakfast from Etiquette. I'm impressed. I hope you like it strong. He handed her a mug, fingers lingering on hers a small smile on his full lips. She took a sip. Ambrosia, thank you. Oh, I fear I may have overdone it last night. We all did. My head's fit to burst. She fetched the pain pills from her bathroom sink and shook two into his waiting palm. Thanks. He swallowed the pills, then, with a grin, swept her up and carried her back to the bedroom. I know the perfect thing to help get rid of these headaches. It was even better sober. My God, Evie thought. He's a magician, and for the moment, he's mine. Later, back in the kitchen, her headache all but gone, the cat happily curled in her basket on the counter. They sipped tea. Evie was amazed at how comfortable she felt with him already. Her usual opposite-sex escapades were simply drunken awkwardness. Thomas felt real, adult, 
full of possibility. My life has started. My real life. No more waiting. No more in between. This, this is what it's going to be. Me and him. Wow. The thought took her breath away. So, what are you up to today? Thomas asked. I have a class at noon, and I was going to write up my impressions of the show last night. We get credit for all the exhibits we attend. What about you? Me? Well, I, um... He suddenly couldn't meet her eyes. Shit, he's taken. She looked down into a tea, feeling stupid and heartbroken. Well, it was nice meeting you. He started to talk, but she raised her hand, cracked a wry smile. No, no, it's fine. It's okay. I don't expect anything from you. I understand. A sharp frown crossed his face. You slept with me, but you don't expect anything? What if I do? You do? He smiled. Yes, Goose. I like you. A lot. What I have to do today, well, it's only that I don't want to freak you out when I tell you. She laughed, the relief palpable. Wow, she really liked this guy. If you're not trying to get far, far away from me, why would I freak out? He bit his lip, a tick she found compelling. When he did it, she could almost feel him biting her lip, too. Out with it, then. He sat at her kitchen table. I have to go to the dovecot to pick up a check. A check? Whatever for? My payment for being in the installation. There's a bonus from opening night, you see. And with everything that was going on last night, I thought I'd wait until today. Oh, I see. You loaned a painting from your gallery. He shook his head. Not exactly. I'm one of the artists. You paint? But Ariel said you were a buyer for a gallery in Inverness. I am. But I'm also an artist. Getting my start, really. To be invited into this exhibit with artists of such stature. That's a big step up for me. A feeling of dread came over her. Which painting, Thomas? The one you hated, of course. That creepy, awful dancing demon? Yes, though that's not a demon. That's a woman. My mother, actually. She used to dance all the time. But it's... Grotesque, I think you called it. Horrifying. He was smiling, and Evie was flustered again. How could she reconcile the man standing in front of her with that crazed black and white beast hanging on the dovecot's wall? His brain had envisioned it. His hands had drawn it, shaped it, bled life into it. His mother? Evie felt the urge to run, right out the door and down the hall, and never come back. But Thomas was grinning now. I'm kidding. That one's not mine. You're right, it's freakish. Mine was the last one we saw, the black and white. You walked away from it so quickly, I thought you hated it too. Relief flooded her, pure and golden, like a warm beam of sun. Thank God. Thank God. Of course he hadn't painted that horrible demon. Of course he'd done the one she loved. I didn't hate it. It was the best one there, and the most beautiful, but why didn't you tell me last night? And why wasn't your name on the placard? I paint under a pseudonym. I find it easier. I don't want there to be any conflicts with my gallery in Inverness. I was afraid to admit it last night. As for why I didn't say anything, the show disturbed you. I didn't want to frighten you off, and I thought, well, I thought that if you knew I was a part of the exhibit and a party to your fear, you might not want to see me any more, and I do want to see you, Evie, very, very much. He moved closer, and she accepted the kiss, deep and soulful. When they parted, she smiled shyly. And I you... You're very talented, you know that? 
your painting, the movement, the structure. Tell me, what is it? What did you see when you looked at it? A canyon, the curve of a breast, a bone, love, darkness, hope, hatred. And that's what it is. Those aren't right, though. I can't put my finger on it exactly. Tell me, what is it to you? I must know. He kissed her palm. What I see, what I painted, doesn't matter. It's meant to be appealing to the viewer. It's meant to be appealing to you. The flush of new love was enough to carry Evie through the following week. Since her flatmate was on holiday, Thomas simply moved out of his hotel and into the flat with her. He was a good flatmate, quiet, clean, and came with the added benefit of an orgasm or two a night. Who needed rent? Evie thought she could get used to this. Every night she heard the scratching at the window. Every night, waking, scared and shaking, she snuggled deeper into Thomas's arms to hide her fear. And every morning she woke clear-eyed and happy. The terrors of the night before chased away by the sun and his languorous kisses. It was almost perfect. The only thing that bothered her was the installation at the dovecot. Evie couldn't stop thinking about the gallery, about the paintings, the way the dancing demon had practically leapt from the wall, and how Thomas had painted something so different, so sublime, so forward yet uninterpretable. She'd never been so affected by art before. Two paintings, so different, so remarkable. Thoughts of them consumed her. She could barely think of anything else. On Monday she found herself walking past the gallery, wondering if she should have another look. On Tuesday she stopped and shielded her eyes against the glass, but couldn't see anything. Wednesday, compelled, she went inside. Thursday she spent the whole afternoon... Friday, the gallery didn't open until noon, and she lingered outside for so long she missed two classes. Then spent the afternoon snug and warm, chills parading up and down her spine, not even avoiding the grinning, happy demon who'd ceased to be frightening. Now it looked silly, goofy, banal, overdone. However could she have been disturbed by such a thing? He was joy incarnate. Now as she walked right past and settled in front of the crevasse, as she'd taken to calling it. According to the placard, its true name was Milky Way, which didn't fit it at all. She should discuss that with Thomas, once she was able to put her thoughts into words in front of him. She didn't know why she felt she needed to hide her entrancement with the piece. He would surely love her attentions. But she didn't want him to know, not yet. There was something special going on. Her relationship with the painting was as intimate as hers with the artist himself. Hour after hour, she stared into the ribbon of blackness, wondering what exactly might be in that darkness. Gazing at it, she realised it was almost as if she could see inside of Thomas, into the chambers of his heart, into his very soul. The darkness had words, too, but no matter how she tried, she couldn't hear them clearly. They were like whispers carried away on the wind. It was frustrating, and it was becoming harder and harder to pull herself away. Friday evening, Thomas was waiting when she came home, an open bottle of wine breathing on the counter. She recognised the label, it was a two-decade-old Chateau Latour, and expensive. What's this? A celebration. He handed her a glass. It's our one-week anniversary. Cheers, darling. She smelled the wine, the notes of tobacco and leather and mint reminding her of the trip to France she and Ariel had taken a few months earlier. She let the ruby liquid settle inside her mouth then took a long swallow. The finish was extraordinary, the wine dark and buried. Do you like it? 
I do. It's delicious. I wanted something special. We can soak off the label and save it. Evie felt warm and blessed. What had she done to deserve this incredible man? A man who loved her body and her mind, who brought her wine and tea, a man who'd painted such a captivating piece of art. Thomas, I do believe you're romantic. Of course I am. I'm romantic about you. Now I have a whole evening planned. But first, I have to run by the dovecot again. They have another check for me. I'm amazed at how often they're willing to pay. I had no idea it would be weekly. I'm going to take the money and you out to dinner. We have reservations at the witchery at eight. Evie's jaw dropped. The witchery was the best restaurant in Edinburgh and priced well outside even her ample allowance. She'd never been, but had walked by longingly several times, admiring the fine parade of well-heeled people who disappeared through its decorated wooden doors. She threw herself in his arms. Thomas, you're incredible. Thank you. He tipped her nose with a finger. I'm so glad you're excited. Now, you get dressed and I'll run to the gallery. I'll be back in thirty minutes, tops, and we'll head up to the Royal Mile. If you don't mind waiting for me, I could go with you. To the dovecot? I thought you hated the installation. Evie waved a hand nonchalantly. There's no sense in you backtracking. Give me fifteen minutes and I'll tag along. I'll admire your work. It was the one painting I liked, remember? And she thought... Maybe the words will reveal themselves when he's near. Thomas nodded, clearly pleased. Brilliant. Let's finish our wine. You can change, and we'll head over. They giggled together on the walk. A deep fog had set in, tendrils curling around the lamp posts like small ghosts, twisting in the amber light from the lanterns. It was perfect, moody, atmospheric and Evie longed to break out a brush and oils and capture the scene. She was no artist, but lately she'd been feeling like she wanted to try again. Would you teach me to paint? Thomas put his arm around her shoulders. I'll teach you anything you want, darling. Good. I love art so much, but I can never seem to recreate it. My mind's eye doesn't translate to the canvas— Maybe you can help me with that. I would be honoured. Shall we start tomorrow? Oh, yes, please. He kissed her, and they entered the dovecot. Evie waved at the demon. She'd named him Evan. Evan and Evie danced in the pale moonlight, tra-la-la, and took up her favourite position next to the crevasse. The words were there again, louder this time whispering and cajoling. She was right. They were excited to see their master. She swore she heard her name. Evie. Darling Evie. She leaned closer, her nose practically touching the canvas. What were they saying? What were they asking? Why couldn't she understand them? A guard stopped to her left and cleared his throat. Startled, she jumped away, slammed right into Thomas, who caught her arm before she fell to the floor. Oops, up you go. Next time I'll be ready when you leap into my arms. The guard was stern. She half expected him to wag a finger at her. Don't get so close to the painting next time, lass. I don't want to have to throw you out. I know how much you love coming here, but don't test my patience again. No, no. I'm sure you've mistaken me for someone else. I haven't been here since last Friday, and I was only here for a moment. The guard frowned. I thought I saw you this afternoon. I'd just come on my shift. Yes, I'm sure it was you, standing just there. She shook her head vehemently. I had classes this afternoon. I wasn't here. Come, Thomas, we should go if we want to make our reservation. As you wish, my lady. And to the guard... You must have seen someone else. My girlfriend isn't fond of the paintings in this exhibit, you see. They frighten her. But 
Have a lovely evening, Evie called, and Thomas took a hand and led her from the building. On the street outside, he seemed to be watching her carefully. Why ever would that man think you'd been at the gallery today? I have no idea. Come on, I'm starving. Let's celebrate. Long fingers scratched at the window, nails black and cracked, and Evie lay awake in the bed, listening, paralysed with fright. Whatever was outside her window had changed in the past few days, gotten darker, malevolent, and more aggressive. It was definitely playing with the window lock. What would happen when it got inside? It would kill her, surely. She wasn't able to fight it any longer. At some point she would be forced out of her bed to the window latch to allow the thing in. She could feel its lure already, lifting her from her warm nest. Thomas stirred and the noise stopped. Evie floated back down to the bed. What's wrong, love? he asked, gathering her to him. Can't sleep. It's nothing, really. I thought I heard a noise, is all. What sort of noise? Scratching on the window. It's silly. It's been happening for days now. I must be dreaming odd things to wake like this. But Thomas was already pulling back the covers. He marched to the bedroom window and peered outside. Well, of course you're hearing scratching, darling. There's a tree branch right outside. It looks like it's broken. It must have fallen into the window, and the wind has made it shiver and shake. Tomorrow I'll get up in the tree and see if I can loosen it. He crawled back under the covers. You're safe with me, Evie. Always. And she knew he was telling the truth. She was safe with him. She'd never felt so safe. As she drifted off to sleep, the scratching started again. She imagined the long branch of the tree scraping against the window and smiled. A perfectly reasonable explanation, of course. She was a silly goose. But the next morning, teacup in her hand, she recalled the conversation and went to the window to see the offending branch. The closest tree was across the street. When she mentioned it to Thomas, he grinned and said she must have been dreaming. He hadn't gotten up in the night. He'd slept through. So had she. She took him at his word, and she didn't hear the scratching again. That day he started her painting lessons. Thomas was a good teacher, patient, kind, but after a few hours it was readily apparent that Evie truly lacked the talent for the discipline. Thomas's painting was bold and inventive. Hers looked like a straggle of black lines. As they cleaned the brushes and palettes, she said, Oh, well, it was worth a try. You only need practice, he replied. It took me years to master some of these skills. She knew he was lying to make her feel better and rewarded him with a kiss. Thankfully, there is something I am good at, she said. Come here. Thomas had planned to be in Edinburgh for only a week, so on Sunday he announced he needed to make a run back to Inverness. He offered to take Evie along, show her his hometown, give her a tour of his studio, help her with her new paints, but she had an exam and had to decline what certainly would have been a very fun trip. He left after breakfast, promising to be back by Wednesday evening, which meant Evie was left alone for two whole days. A large part of her had wanted to join him on his trek north. She was actually rather afraid to stay by herself. As promised, Thomas had made the scratching stop somehow, and she was worried it would begin again without him there as a buffer. But in truth, she was reluctant to be parted from his painting. She walked him to the train station and waved the train away. Then, instead of heading to class and her exam, she went directly to the dovecot. It had been two days since she'd been there. They'd spent the whole weekend in, mostly in bed, and she was feeling jittery again. 
the security guard who'd confronted her, was on duty again. He narrowed his eyes when he saw her, but didn't make a move to speak to her. She moved past him quickly and stationed herself in front of the canvas. At first there was nothing, only the quiet serenity of the darkness, but as she stared, the whispering voices started. This time they grew in intensity until she could hear them clearly. Evie, Evie, look inside us, Evie. We're waiting for you. Look inside. They were so loud she was sure everyone could hear them, but no one else in the gallery seemed to be looking her way. How strange. How very strange. The words manifested and began dancing around her head. She watched them until, out of the corner of her eye, something else moved. Her head pivoted toward the canvas. There was nothing. Oh yes, there, in the darkness. A figure moved in the black crevasse. Though not overtly sexualized, she knew immediately the figure was male, and he seemed to be waving at her. Then he walked away and disappeared. She reached out to hand. She just wanted to touch it, to feel the rough pebble of paint under her fingertips. No, don't, don't touch, Evie, don't touch. She whipped her hand back as if it had been burned, confused. The voices in her head weren't masculine, but they weren't feminine either. Who were they coming from? They sounded familiar somehow, comforting, like happy memories from her childhood. Think, Evie, think, they said. But she couldn't place them. No matter how hard she tried, no matter how many images of grassy fields and red balloons and nights with cocoa in front of the fire and mother's hugs flooded her mind. If you don't remember... We'll go home with you, they said, and she smiled, for she wouldn't have to be alone while Thomas was away. But only until he returns, she said, sternly, drawing odd glances from the other patrons, and the voices laughed in appreciation and said in unison, Of course, Evie, only until he returns. The voices stayed with her, crooning and happy, hugging her shoulders like the warmest cashmere. While she went to the university and took her exam, even helping in a few places when she got stuck. Then, at their insistence, she picked up two bottles of wine and some groceries. Back in her flat, she took the phone off the hook, turned off her mobile and opened the wine. She drank deeply, and refilled her glass. She felt good, light, airy, different. The voices approved. Dance, Evie. It's time for you to dance. She agreed, even took off her clothes so her movements wouldn't be hampered. She dipped and twirled around the flat until sweat dripped down her body. Sweat. Paint. She needed to paint, needed to paint now. Paint, Evie, paint. She started with the windows in her bedroom, because if the scratcher couldn't see in, perhaps it would forget she was there. Black, all black, thick and opaque. The paint smelled lovely, oily and liquid, alive. She admired her handiwork. It was too boring. She added a star, and then another. Within half an hour she'd painted a full-blown galaxy. Stars and quasars and a supermassive black hole tucked away on the far corner. She'd never known how gloriously beautiful the night sky could be. Now she had something to look at when she woke in the night. A celestial Valhalla waiting for her. That's what the darkness was, perhaps, the manifestation of the universe, empty and cold. He did call it Milky Way, after all. 
No, Evie, that's not right. We aren't heaven. Try again. With a sigh, she cleaned her brush of the black oil like she'd been taught by... What was his name again? Handsome, talented... Thomas, yes, that was it. Goodness, Evie, you've had too much to drink. No, you haven't. Have some more. She went to the second bottle and opened it, poured out a glass, then spread fresh paint on her palette and got moving. There was so much to do, so many visions dancing in her head. The voices were such good company, they made her laugh, made her see infinite skies. She danced and painted and drank, and the cat watched in confusion as Evie moved from wall to wall, room to room, window to window. She ran out of wine, but that was okay. She was drunk on something more, something better. The voices pushed her and pushed her, and though her arms and hand were tired, she kept moving until the very last corner was finished. Good, Evie, good. Sleep now, they commanded, and she dropped in place, head blanketed on her arms, and slept without moving. What the bleeding hell? Evie realised she was awake, terribly, horribly awake. She opened her eyes to the face of her flatmate, who was standing over her, mouth open in a perfectly round O. What are you doing down there? What in the world happened in here? Get up! For heaven's sake, Evie! Did you have a stroke or something? Get up! Morag hauled Evie to her feet. Ow! Stop that! My God, Evie! You're black and blue! Were you in an accident? A car crash? Evie looked down at her naked body. She realised she hurt, badly, all over. She was covered in bruises, huge splotches of deep red and black. Her hands were rubbed raw, her fingers bent like a crone's. She tried to straighten them, gasped in pain. No, Crash, then who did this to you? Them... But the rest wouldn't come out. Her voice was garbled. Nothing sounded right. How could she explain the voices to Morag without her thinking Evie'd gone off her rocker? She breathed deeply, felt some clarity return. I'm fine. Truly. She started into the kitchen, tripped and went down with a howl. Morag was having nothing of it. All right, you. Off to hospital we go. No, no hospital. Evie managed. I'm fine. You're bloody well not. You can barely move. And look around. What in the heavens have you been doing since I left? Where did you find an artist like this? It must have taken the whole fortnight to do all of this. It's rather brilliant, but you could have asked, especially since I'm sure it cost... Evie shuffled in a small circle, eyes wide. The entire apartment was covered in paintings. Some were abstract, some were detailed. Cityscapes, landscapes, flowers, gardens, people, lines, circles, squares, a museum's worth of paintings all over her walls. All were in shades of black and white, not a single bit of colour. A few, the ones closest to where she'd fallen, were in such intricate detail they almost looked like photographs. It was glorious, spectacular, a life's work. Evie looked at Morag, who was shaking her head, eyes wide and frightened. Perhaps we'd best go to hospital after all, Evie. You're pale as a ghost, and your poor hand... I think your fingers might be broken. Please, dearest, tell me what's happened. Who did this? It took all of her courage to say, I did. You? You painted all of this? My God, Evie, these should be in a gallery. 
that amazing? A small V formed between her feathery brows. I don't understand. How did you get so hurt? Evie straightened, despite the pain in her back and legs. I'm going to take a shower. I'm sure a little warm water will fix things. But the bruises? Evie, you're scaring me. I'm fine, Morag. I was inspired and I worked too long. I didn't know you could paint like this. There was a note of jealousy in Morag's voice, a wistful element that made Evie glow with pride. Evie cast another glance around the flat. Neither did I. And the voices laughed and laughed. Thomas came back on Wednesday as promised. Evie's bruises hadn't faded, and her right hand was still bent as if it permanently held a paintbrush. When he knocked on the door of the flat, Morag opened it. Who are you? he asked, and Evie was surprised by his tone. She'd never heard him say anything remotely cruel, but his words were like a slap. She couldn't leap to her feet as she wanted, but she managed to turn her head just as Thomas barreled through the door, carelessly knocking Morag aside. He took one look at her and beelined to the couch, dropped to his knees at her feet. Evie, he breathed in horror. She knew how terrible she looked. She'd covered the mirror in a bathroom with a black towel. It was the one surface she hadn't painted, and she couldn't help but wonder why. The towel prevented her from looking at herself. It was too painful. She didn't know what was happening. Her eyes were blackened, her jaw swollen. Her neck had four black ovals on the left and one larger one on the right, as if a spectral hand had choked her. The rest of her was covered in bruises too, just as bad. He turned on Morag. What have you done to her? Thomas, stop. Morag is my flatmate. She's home from holiday. I don't care who she is. What happened to you? I... I... I was painting, and I fell. At the word painting, Thomas's eyes cast about the room. He stood, walked to the wall. My God, you didn't say how good you were. I'm not. It's a fluke. I don't know how I did it. It just happened. I drank too much and I painted all night and then I fell down and bruised myself. It was the story Evie had decided on. It was the only logical explanation she could give to the people around her. But how could she share what had really happened? That the voices from Thomas's painting were inside her had driven her to these heights that they whispered and whispered and whispered, that she welcomed them like the warmest caress. She was clearly going mad, and he'd never understand. Was she to tell him she thought his painting was driving her mad? He'd be out the door in a second, and she'd never see him again. Interestingly, now that their master was here, the voices were silent, but they were not gone. She could feel them inside of her, tensed in all her corners, tails whipping like cats getting ready to pounce. Her body recoiled with the pressure of their tautness. Stop it, she whispered, and they relaxed. The pain in her body lessened. She let out a breath. At least they were still listening to her today. They were unruly children, babies but growing fast. What would she do when they grew up and got minds of their own, or banded together and took over like they had on Sunday night? She loved them. She was terrified of them. She didn't know what to do. Not true. She knew exactly what she must do. Go back to the gallery, to the painting, and ask them to rejoin their parents, their waiting lives in the crevasse. For it was waiting. Even from inside her flat she could sense it, cocked, at the ready, willing to spring into action and swallow the whole world. She looked at Thomas in a new light now. 
He'd created this thing. She didn't yet know if it was evil or good. You know what we are, Evie. We are inspiration. We are creativity. We are the muses. We are you. Could he have done such a thing? Created a muse? Was he some sort of god? Maybe not a god. A demon? Evan, the dancing demon, popped into her head, his sly smile greeting her like an old friend. Won't you come dance with me, Evie? I miss you. He reached out and grabbed her shoulder, spun her round like a ballerina on point. I'm sorry, but I can't dance now, Evie said, realising Morag and Thomas were standing in front of her. Morag was snapping her fingers under Evie's nose. See what I mean? She's been like this since I got home Monday. It's like she just disappears. Her eyes go wobbly, unfocused. She becomes completely unresponsive. And look, there's a new bruise. Evie's collarbone ached. She put her bent, broken hand on it and hissed in pain. When she looked up, Morrig and Thomas were staring as if she'd lost her mind. What? What is it? What's wrong with you two? Thomas knelt again. Darling, I think we need to take you to hospital. Your bruises are getting worse. I think there may be a bleed somewhere. You must have hit your head. You may have a concussion. You're not making sense. Morrig's right. We need to get you checked out. No, I won't go, Evie said. But he ignored her, scooped her into his arms. I'll call when I know something, he said, voice grave. Morrig swallowed her tears and nodded. Evie tried shaking her head but couldn't. It hurt again. So she nestled in to Thomas's arms and felt some of the pain leave her. The doctor, older, with a full head of wild grey hair, stood over her, hands shaking. Thrombocytopenia, one of the worst cases I've ever seen. Her body's platelet count has bottomed out. Without it, her blood can't clot. So if she's in an accident or a fall, she'll bruise horribly and they won't heal. We need to start her on some medication straight away, try to build up her platelet count. Thank heavens you brought her in. This is very dangerous. I'm fine, Evie said, though she knew she wasn't. She couldn't imagine what she was thinking. She needed help, needed to get the voices out of her head. But something inside her made the opposite words come out. I need help became, I'd like to go home now. The doctor shook his leonine head. You need to be treated, miss or else there's a chance you'll get worse. Evie, you're not going anywhere, and that's final, Thomas said. You'll be treated, and once you're cured, then you can go home, and that's the end of it. She saw a twinkle in his eye and knew he was just placating the doctor. He'd get her out of here. He wouldn't let her be fixed. She didn't want to be fixed. She did but she knew what she'd lose if she allowed it. He held her good hand and smoothed her hair off her forehead. She relaxed, the voices relaxed, and a few minutes after the IV began tripping, they all fell deeply asleep. When she woke, all was silent. The bruises were fading, the pain was gone. The voices, too, had departed, She felt empty, blissfully so, like herself again. She sat up, amazed at how clear she felt. Thomas was asleep in the chair across from her bed. His head was propped up by his right hand, his left was curled in his lap. The chair's arm held open his spot in a book. So handsome, such a lovely boy to look at. But something wasn't right about him. She could tell that now. 
He was wrong inside. Things moved beneath his skin. She needed to get away from him. She shifted, thinking she'd grab her clothes and steal away, but he came awake at once, looking as protective and worried as he had when he stormed into a flat hours earlier. Surely someone so concerned for her well-being couldn't be all bad. Hi, she said. You look so much better. Her hand went to her throat. Seriously, the bruises are all but gone. Pretty amazing medicine. How do you feel? Better. I don't hurt. You're stubborn, you know that? Trying to avoid coming here, trying to leave. Are you scared of doctors? No, I didn't think I needed to be seen. Clearly, I was wrong. Thank you for helping me. She kept her tone neutral, and in response he hadn't gotten up to kiss her like she'd expected he would. Maybe, now that she had this frightening disease, he wouldn't want her any more. The thought made her briefly sad, but somehow she knew it was for the best. Thomas crossed his legs and steepled his fingers under his chin. I thought you weren't a painter. I mean, what we did on the weekend, the instruction I gave you. You were faking, needing my help to make me feel good, weren't you? No, I'm not a painter. I told you so. But you don't deny painting the walls of your flat? I did it, but I don't know how. I don't really remember. I was drunk, though. Very drunk. The excuse sounded lame, and she knew it. He tipped his head. They're really quite extraordinary, Evie. You have talent. Real, unadulterated talent. Maybe the platelet issue made me have some sort of fit, and that's why I painted the way I did. Like a short circuit of some kind. Morag said she thought perhaps I'd had a small stroke. Hmm. Well, it certainly wasn't my teaching. Are you sure there isn't something else going on, Evie? She shifted again, drawing her legs to her chin and wrapping her arms around them. His allure was so intense, she was trying to retreat from it. But the more they talked, the more she wanted to be with him. She wanted him badly. She wanted him now. Resist, Evie, a single voice, high and whining like a mosquito in her ear. No, Evie, don't resist. You want him. He wants you. You're perfect together. What do you mean, something else? She asked. I don't know. You are talking in your sleep, talking to someone, begging, really, for them to leave you alone. I know you have bad dreams, but this was terrible. I couldn't wake you. I had to let you get through it. It was like you were doing battle or something. I don't even remember. I must have had a strange reaction to the drugs they gave me. When can I go home? The doctor said if you responded well, they'd release you today. Good, she said, giving him a tenuous smile. How was Inverness? Fine. I brought down a few more pieces. The dovecot asked for them. That's wonderful news. You think so? He looked away, shyly, embarrassed. I do. Thomas, you're incredible. You're painting... Well, I'll tell you a secret. I've been visiting your painting. It's so amazing. It makes me feel like the world is infinite, that I can do anything. You inspire me, Thomas. Good girl. They were back, all of them buzzing happily. He came to her bed, sat next to her. Really? Tell him the truth, Evie. Tell him all of it. She couldn't help herself now. The words began to pour out. Yes, I know this is super weird, but I feel like me getting sick like this is a sign of some kind, that I'm meant to do something different. School seems silly now that I know your art exists. I was thinking perhaps I could help you market and sell your work. You're dead. You do? I think you're bloody brilliant. He kissed her then, and her heart beat faster. 
a bruise appeared on her arm. That's bizarre. Kiss me again. I don't want to hurt you. Do it. He did, and a bruise appeared on her other arm. Again. This time he went slowly, deeply, until he was stretched out beside her and her gown was rocked up around her waist. The bruising spread all over her stomach and chest. She looked at it in fascination. Does it hurt? he asked. No, it doesn't. When my heart speeds up, the bruising occurs. When it slows, they fade. It must be the medicine, Evie. I think it's you. I think my blood is literally trying to touch you. He held a hand over her breast, not touching, and the bruise bloomed bright and red. My God! He smiled, and there was something chilling in the way he looked at her. Apparently so. I don't understand. How can this be? You're mine, Evie. That's how. Evie got out of the hospital the next day. She went home with a prescription for prednisone and admonishments not to overdo. The flat was overwhelming. All that black and white staring out at her, Morag giving Thomas disapproving looks, so she asked Thomas to take her to the gallery instead. Just for the exercise, the fresh air will do me good. He agreed, and Evie went into her room to get a coat. Morag followed her in and shut the door. Avy, stop right now. Who is this guy? I come home from vacation and suddenly there's a man living in our flat and I don't know anything about him. He gives me the creeps. Ariel said you two have been inseparable. Thomas gives you the creeps? Wow, Morag, I didn't know you were the jealous type. Those heavy brows looked forbidding now instead of striking. Morag was not a beautiful woman. Jealousy made her even uglier. How could Evie have ever thought her pretty or a suitable flatmate? Evie, I'm serious. You have no idea who he is. Of course I do. He's friends with Ariel. She knows him from school in Inverness. Came down for a gallery showing. Happens to be an incredible artist. And he is wildly infatuated with me. Evie grabbed her jacket. A card fell out of the pocket. It was the invite to the gallery exhibit. See, he's got a painting in the exhibit. That's rather wonderful, Morag. You should come see it. It's the most glorious painting I've ever seen, this huge white canvas with a dark crevasse through the middle. And there are so many things to see in that darkness. I think I'll pass, and you should too. I'm dead serious. Something is totally wrong with that guy. And with you. He shows up. You go into a bizarre trance and slap paint all over the apartment, then get deathly ill. While you were in the hospital, he came back here two nights running by himself and walked around and around the flat, touching all the paintings, cooing to himself. Cooing? Cooing, like a bleeding dove. It freaked me out. You're being silly. I'm sure he was assessing my work for its value. He was probably saying wow or something like that. It is good, you know, saleable. No, you freak. He was cooing at the walls, crooning like they were having a conversation. They seemed to be talking back to him. I could almost hear something, like voices. They're mine. Stay away. Now who sounds crazy? Seriously, Evie, don't go out with him. I have a terrible feeling... Evie gave her flatmate a pat on the arm. Worry not. Thomas is a fabulous guy. You'll see. And if you don't like him, you're welcome to leave. No one's forcing you to stay. Evie! But she breezed from the room. There was no sense listening to Morag and her crazy stories. Who was calling whom a freak anyway? Morag was a jealous, bitter woman, destined to be alone not like Evie. Evie was going to be someone, and Thomas was her ticket there. 
Thomas was waiting patiently, sitting at the kitchen counter, a half-smile on his face as if he'd heard the whole conversation. He gave Evie a nod. Well said, love. Now, let's get going. Outside, they huddled together as they walked to the gallery. A sleet had started, nothing gentle about it, and the cold seeped down Evie's neck, chilling her deeply. I'm cold. Can we stop for tea along the way? I need to take my pills, too. Thomas didn't seem to notice she was speaking to him. He was walking quickly, almost too fast, and Evie was having trouble keeping up. Slow down, she finally gasped, but he just took her arm. She could feel the bruise start instantly, a hot rush as the bloom of red blood rose to the surface and pulled her along. You're hurting me! Stop! A couple hurrying past glanced at them but kept going. Thomas continued to drag her forward, past the gallery, into a dark alley. Thomas! Thomas, where are we going? You're hurting me! Stop! Please, please stop! No answer. Evie started to scream, but Thomas was quick. He slammed her against the alley wall and put his lips on hers so she was yelling into his mouth. It was the strangest sensation, almost as if he were infinite inside. And she screamed and screamed and screamed until she was hoarse. To anyone walking by it looked like they were in the most intimate of embraces, but Evie felt the bruising spreading. All over her body, pain, every inch of her was being assaulted. Wherever he touched, black marks bloomed. When he released her, she was writhing. He put his arm above her head and leaned in, smiling. Now, do you understand? She couldn't speak. It hurt too much. She felt like knives were driving themselves into her skin, into her muscles, her bones. Even his voice hurt. She didn't understand what was happening, not really, but she nodded because if she agreed, maybe the pain would stop. He released her, and it did. Thomas laughed a little. I know you don't really understand, Evie. You couldn't. There's no way for you to truly comprehend what's happening, but you will. Now, we're going inside, and you're going to paint for me. I can't. My hand is in a splint. You will. I won't. Here's how this works, little Evie. I can cause great pain for you. Do what I ask, and you can have your medicine after I touch you. Don't, and soon you'll be crippled. You'll be broken and withered with nothing to live for. No one will ever love you. He ran a finger along her neck, the path searing and bubbling, blisters joining the bruising. A crushing sensation followed. The pain was unbearable. Who are you? she gasped. I am Thomas. Now, on we go. The warehouse was black, a maw, empty and obscenely cold. She began to shiver immediately. Her teeth were chattering, the bruises fading, the blisters healing. Welcome, Evie. Welcome home. The voices called, merry and bright. What is this place? Thomas flipped on a light, and the warehouse was suddenly aglow. From blackness came white, blinding white. The walls, ceiling, floor perfectly pristine, empty. On the far wall was a small slit of black, a void. She was in a void. She walked hesitantly toward the far wall, a hand outstretched for balance, until she reached the blackness. It felt familiar somehow. She ran her fingers along its edges. It was heavy and thick, with hardened oil. The paint. Was it paint? It smelled odd, 
coppery, musty. She licked her lips. The blackness was on her, in her, and she started to panic. Thomas stood next to her, leaning against the wall with his arms crossed, a leg propped against the perfect white. Do you understand what I'm showing you, dear Evie? Her head moved slowly toward his, everything slow, dawning comprehension. Then the voices began to laugh. Happy, so, so happy. Do you understand, Evie? I asked you a question. She leaned closer, her face almost touching the blackened wall, and saw the security guard from the dovecot walk past. She jerked back with a scream, and Thomas laughed. You do understand? I'm so proud of you. It took Bridget days to riddle it out. She didn't want to let the words form in her brain. She was in the painting. She was on the opposite side of the painting. This was the inverse of the wall of the dovecot. Did he just say Bridget? This is impossible. This isn't happening. I'm having a terrible, awful dream. Oh, it is possible. And it is happening, dear sweet Evie. You're mine now. As he spoke, the walls around her changed, glowing red. Evie saw a young woman with her long brown hair pulled back in a ponytail, eyes huge in her emaciated face holding a paintbrush in a clawed, skeletal hand. He saw a man who looked just like Thomas, a smile on his face, putting the finishing touches on a painting, white with black. She saw many things, beasts, flames, melted faces, dusty bones. She didn't understand. She couldn't fathom what was happening to her. She looked back at Thomas. He was no longer a handsome young artist. He was Evan, the demon, his nose a bird's beak, his mouth a wide, grinning slash, his hands tipped in black claws. Hello, Evie, she screamed, but nothing came out. Like the other package better? You be a good girl, and I'll put the mask back on. Can I trust you to be good? She nodded. Thomas, her Thomas, was back, though now she could see the infinite darkness in his sooty eyes. How had she ever missed that? You aren't Thomas. Oh, he's been gone for quite some time. But he is the perfect package. I like wearing his skin. It makes me happy to have so many admiring glances. It made bringing you home infinitely easier. Where is the real Thomas? He tipped his head as if in thought. Oh, Thomas is dead. Very, very dead. Dead and gone. When did you kill him? The bird-like face cracked open again, the approximation of a grotesque smile... Ages ago. Who are you? I am you. I am your destiny. No paint. A brush appeared in his hand, and he handed it over, along with a freshly daubed palette of black, white, and grey oils. She thought to refuse, but her hand lifted of its own will, dipped in the blackness, and spread across the white wall. Paint, Evie! Paint with us! Happiness flowed through her, and she danced, danced and painted, painted and danced, until the entire warehouse was covered in her visions. The voices danced along with her, joyful and happy, for they had a new friend to play with. The darkness wasn't as dark any more. Evie woke in her bed, in her flat. She was alone. There was a bruise on her arm, and her hand was clawed again, her knuckles swollen and red. 
She fought the pain as she straightened her fingers, slipped on the splint the doctor had given her. She wanted it all to be a dream, but it wasn't. She knew he'd come back for her. He'd promised as much. He'd woven a spell around her so she couldn't tell anyone what was happening or where she'd been. It was the contract, he said, and she would follow it to the letter, or she would be killed. She got up to make tea. Her bedroom door was locked. She looked over her shoulder and the bedroom disappeared. The warehouse was back, the walls white and pristine again. She could hear laughter. The voices said, Don't you understand now, Evie? You're destined to be with us. You make us happy. You make us complete. Where'd he go? Away. Who are you? Names. So many names. And she understood more now what was happening. That Thomas... No, not Thomas. That thing had taken all of these people and turned them into his slaves. When will he kill me? He doesn't need to. You will paint until you die. What did I do to deserve this? Nothing. You did nothing wrong, sweet Evie. We are here with you always. We want to dance, Evie. Please, let's dance. The brush appeared in her hand and she was off. It happened three times, the painting, the sleeping, the waking. Days, nights, weeks, she had no idea. Time did not exist here in any discernible way. All she knew was she had to find a way out. Her body was already shrinking. There was no food, no water. When she had painted the entire warehouse, she stood looking into the gallery, watching people come by. She waved at a woman once, realised it was Morag, coming to visit the painting. There were police with her. Evie listened so hard, but couldn't hear the words. She pounded on the walls and screamed, but they couldn't hear her. She had to free herself. She had to get out of here. But how? And how could she leave the voices behind, all of them lost together? She ruined all her work, running her hands through the paint, looking for a catch, a hinge, a knob to a door, anything, anything. She found no exits, nor answers, and fell exhausted into a dreamless sleep. The warehouse was pristine again in the morning. Days passed. She had no idea how many, only that she was smaller and smaller. She could see the outlines of her bones in her arms now. It took less and less time to paint the walls. She was getting more practised. The work was improving. She had no idea what the demon did with it. He dismantled it while she slept, or someone else came and painted the walls white again. She was going to die in here. She knew it. Over and over the hell continued. Thomas came to her at night, bringing pleasure and pain in his wake. Once he was finished with her, she'd fall into a dreamless sleep, and the walls were white again when she woke. Black and white, black and white. The bruises bloomed whenever he touched her. She was thirsty, so thirsty. She would do anything for a drink. The bruises, red and black, rotting her skin from the inside out. They hurt. The pain was unbearable, but his touch was worse. It seared her skin. The blisters made her body shred. She dropped bits of skin as she moved now, as if she was disintegrating, her bones turning to dust. She should be dead. She should have died. She had no idea why or how she was still alive. Even Thomas gave her pitying glances when she disrobed. 
Gone were her strong girl thighs and shoulders. Gone were her breasts. Her hair had sloughed off days earlier. Her teeth were loose in their gums. She had nothing. She was nothing. Only a paintbrush and a deep, gnawing fear. And then came the blood, inevitable as the tides. And with it, an idea. Save us, Evie. Save us! Her painting done for the day, Evie, that was her name, right? She was a girl they called Evie, stumbled around the warehouse. She could see her bones clearly through the skin now, luminescent lines of architecture keeping her upright, allowing her to continue painting. Her ligaments were strained to the snapping point, her tendons glistening as they moved. Her eyes felt like they might fall out of their sockets. She made her way to the wall opposite the painting, the best approximation she could figure for the entrance to this hell, centred herself and began to scratch. Her skin was loose and ready, her nails uncut for weeks, and the blood rose to the surface. The idea had come to her in a sleep, born on the voice of a young woman, the sound so soft and subtle she nearly missed it. Spill the blood, spill the blood. Her blood would open the door, so she kept at it until her fingers were raw and her arms moist with red. She wiped her hands all over her body, the smell wet and musky. When she was covered, she started sliding down the wall. Let me out, let me out, let me out. The words were her mantra. It took ages. She was slimy and covered in dust and rot. But she finally felt a tiny click to her left, there on the wall, a hinge hidden perfectly in the crack. With a cry of triumph, she wedged her finger bones in and pulled with all her might. The door opened. She stumbled into a pitch-black alley. She could smell and taste and feel everything. She fell to her knees and began to crawl. She heard voices, not her friends, not the kittens who'd become tigers inside of her, but real voices, people walking the street. There was a scream, and then there was nothing. They let her out of the hospital on a sunny day two months later. She was still underweight, but her hair had started to grow back in, and though the scars were never going to go away, Evie's skin was whole again, too. Morag offered to bring her to the flat, though she'd gotten a new flatmate while Evie was away. Away. What a thing to call it. Said flatmate was on holiday, and Evie was welcome to stay. She didn't want to go back there. She didn't want to be anywhere near her old life, except the cat. She'd ask Morag to deliver James Madison to her. She took a hotel room on the Royal Mile and made plans for her final escape, spent the day walking slowly up and down the street. Her mind didn't work all the way. She knew she needed to do something but couldn't completely recognise what it was. Her thoughts were still consumed with the painting. Thomas was gone. The demon hadn't returned. Once she'd broken out of the warehouse, been taken to hospital and nursed back into being, she'd spoken haltingly to a detective inspector. The D.I. knew Evie had been seeing a young man named Thomas, whose body had been found in the River Ness upstream from the infirmary bridge. He'd committed suicide, his arms slashed to the bone. Evie knew the demon had done it, wondered for the millionth time where he'd gone. Maybe she had killed him. Maybe by getting out of the warehouse she'd managed to break his spell. She didn't know. She oftentimes didn't care. She was sorry for Thomas, but she hadn't known him long. Who knew when the demon had taken him over? 
from the beginning, perhaps. She probably never knew him at all. The D.I. wondered if Evie knew who had held her captive. What was she supposed to say? It was a demon? They'd lock her back in the hospital, but the one for the insane people now, where the white walls would be painted with other, baser things. The warehouse where she'd been kept was an empty space, derelict and broken down, but no one could find the door she swore existed. Nothing reconciled with Evie's truth outside of her DNA on the ground in the alley. So she lied about who she knew held her and said she had no idea who he was, that he'd grown tired of her and thrown her from a car. They searched the cameras in the area and thought it strange, as Evie seemed to appear in the darkness on hands and knees, but in the end they were happy to have her home safe. She did tell them about seeing the bones of Bridget Wallace. She didn't know where they were, and it hardly cleared the case, but she wanted the family to know their daughter was dead, so they could mourn properly. Walking, walking, walking. It hit her. She needed to fly home to America as soon as possible. She needed to get the money from her bank accounts, go to an online cafe, book the ticket, arrange for the cat to come home with her too. She set off, moving slowly. She still had very little strength. She went through her old neighbourhood, almost by chance. The sun was too bright, and Evie ducked into the nearest building to catch her breath. Looking around, she realised she'd walked into the dovecot. Muscle memory. So many hours spent on this path. She turned to leave. She didn't want anything to do with the place. But out of the corner of her eye, a smile beckoned. A crevasse deepened, and she felt her legs moving of their own accord. The painting was still there. Thomas's painting. She whirled, but the grinning demon was gone. The other walls were blank, the exhibit done in transition for the next installation, but Thomas's painting still hung on the wall. She crept closer, closer still, looked into the darkness, heard the voices. Where have you been, Evie? We missed you. Come back. No, no. She looked around wildly. There was a pallet nearby with a knife meant for scraping off the dried paint. She grabbed the knife and stepped to the painting, grim and resolute. The blade slashed through the canvas like it was butter, and she ripped and shredded the painting until it fell in ribbons on the floor around her. Panting, head swimming, she grinned maniacally. She'd done it. She'd killed it. She'd killed him. She could feel the last bits of darkness leave her soul. You freed us, Evie! You freed us! The voices gambled around her, then scampered away. She dropped the knife to the floor, felt a sharp pain in her finger, looked down to see a tiny drop of blood emerge from the cut. Blood in the cut. She had blood in the cut. She took a step back. She had to leave. She had to leave now. But she was frozen in place. The drop grew, glistening in the bright lights, then fell off the edge of her finger. It landed on a small ribbon of the painting. The ribbon sighed. It moved, curled and lengthened. It touched its brother and then another. As she watched in horror, compelled, unable to move, the painting resurrected itself, knitted back together, shred by shred, piece by piece. And the closer it was to being whole, the more transparent Evie became. She couldn't scream. She couldn't cry. She couldn't feel. She simply disappeared. She heard the voices crying out as she was subsumed. Welcome back, Evie! Welcome back! 
and the painting was whole again, perfect, undamaged, hanging on the wall for all to see. Police appeal. Messing. Avalyn Evie Williams. Hashtag find Evie. Evie was last seen 18 October 2017 near the Ghost Walk tour booth on High Street in Edinburgh, close to her flat on Johnson Terrace. She is described as a white girl, aged 22, approximately 5 foot 5 inches, with long brown hair and brown eyes. She is an American student studying at the University of Edinburgh and spends a great deal of time at the art galleries around town. We are keen to find her whereabouts and to hear if the public has any knowledge of her movements the day she disappeared. If you can help, please call Edinburgh Police. Morag hated the poster. She couldn't help but see it. She'd placed it there, after all. Hung it on the pole above the one for that poor Bridget girl. The one Evie had been obsessed with. Saw it in the morning. Saw it in the evening. When Evie had disappeared only a few days out of hospital, and news of Thomas MacBean's death spread... She hadn't known what to think. Evie had been so broken, so hurt. That man had done something to her mind, and then he killed himself. But he'd killed Evie, too. Morag was certain of it, though she put the posters up anyway, just in case. They were organising another search, starting at the place where Evie was last seen, the gallery. Morag was to meet Ariel and the others there. She went early, wanting to feel closer to Evie somehow. The painting Evie had loved so much was hanging on the wall in a place of honour. The death of the artist had made it worth a great deal of money, and he'd apparently bequeathed it to the dovecot. Morag stood in front of it. She couldn't understand what anyone saw in it. It was a nasty white dirty like old snow, traversed by a big black slash. And they call this art? To each his own, or her own. As she turned to leave, she could have sworn she heard a voice calling, Hello, Morak. Hello. She glanced over her shoulder but saw nothing. Ariel appeared at the window waving for her, so she started for the door, but she heard the voice again. She shivered, took one step back toward the painting, toward that longing, lonely call. Then Morag shook her head once, twice, certain her ears were playing tricks on her, and hurried out to the street to meet the others. And so it waited. They waited. Author's Note All the paintings Evie sees at the Dovecot actually exist. If you'd like to see them, visit twotalespress.com slash the hyphen in darkening. The author would like to extend her deepest gratitude to the artists in the collection for their incredible work. Their dark visions were the catalyst for this story to go to even darker places, and I highly recommend checking them out. The author would also like to thank Ian Rankin for the inspiration. P.S. Thomas was lying. The crevasse painting Evie was obsessed with was inspired by Alison Watts' brilliant thorn. This story was inspired by a show I saw on the BBC in which brilliant Scottish crime fiction author Ian Rankin was interviewed whilst attending an exhibit at the Dovecot in Edinburgh. The installation was called The Scottish Endarkenment, Art and Unreason, 1945 to the Present, and featured very dark art indeed. One of the paintings looked like a Rothko, but I couldn't identify it. So I reached out to Ian, who sent me to the Dovecot, and they helped me find the painting, which was actually by William Turnbull. As I watched the super cool video the Dovecot had put together to show off the installation, seeing painting after painting, a completely surreal idea surfaced. What if there was a painting that was actually a serial killer? I outlined the story at that moment and wrote it soon after, quite quickly, in big swaths of time. It simply poured out of me, 
and when you read it, I think you'll understand why that was at once exciting and horrifying. Writing is always a gift, but sometimes it has a bit too much of the red shoes in it, don't you think? I hope you enjoy this dark little tale. The Omen Days Christmas, Nashville, Tennessee Mercy Lounge, heaving masses of bodies writhing back and forth in time with a heavy bass beat, yelling and screaming, happy faces locked on the stage, eyes lit up and mouths stretched into manic grins. It smells like teen spirit and brimstone and cold iron from the overhead girders, which are sprinkled with fake frost, all overlaid with the thick, sweet scent of liquor. Guilty pleasures are playing a Christmas show. I am drinking. Heavily. I hate Christmas. It's not only the weather. Christmas in the South is hit or miss. Some years it's 80 degrees and we're playing football in the backyard. Others... It's cold enough for snow, light dustings of white crystal shadowing everything. Most years, though, it's freezing cold and bleak and empty, slate skies with nothing falling but the temperature and my mood. What's the point of Christmas without snow? But that's Nashville for you, utterly unpredictable, especially during the holidays when the kids are off from school and the parents are high on rage and champagne and tinsel and greed loaded with murderous intent. Thinking about it, maybe hate isn't a strong enough word. I loathe Christmas. I despise it. I would rather dig a hole the first weekend of December and emerge again with that poor groundhog in February when the insanity and water cooler talk of the holidays are truly over. Maybe it's because I don't have a family nearby and I'm not religious and as low man on the totem pole, I usually get stuck on call. There's nothing like being an undercover cop on Christmas. You see everything humanity has to give at the holidays. It's like the full moon. It brings out the worst in people, and it brings out the best in others. I rarely see the best, though. Nature of the beast. Maybe it's because people are harried, tired of the year and the demands of their lives, or because they're ready to turn over a new leaf, to start fresh, start again. It does feel like we're all simply going through the motions. And not maybe. Truth. Spending the holidays alone sucks. What I do sort of like are the days after Christmas. That time when all goes quiet. Silent night, holy night. All is calm, all is bright. A certain peace steals over the city as if everyone's breath is held in anticipation of the new year. The calendar didn't used to have an exact number of days, and it ran according to the sun. The long nights and shorter days of winter meant there were always a few days at the end of the sun year that didn't fit in with the calendar. This is a mystical time. If you look at your Greek, Norse, or Roman mythology, this is when legends are born, when gods and goddesses spring forth crossing the veil of the two worlds, blurring the lines between mortal and immortal. This is where the 12 days of Christmas really comes from, 
not silly gifts of French hens and lords leaping and partridges. It's those lost days at the end of the year. The omen days. I think it would be better if we called them by their true title. It's more fitting, really. You can figure out a lot about your life in those twelve days after Christmas, when the old year dies and all its highs and lows become a memory. But whatever you call it, or I call it, I can't find the joy in the season. Not anymore. It hasn't been a real Christmas since I lost her. So I count the days until the season draws to a close and do everything I can to distract myself, like tonight's bacchanalia on Cannery Row. Grimy shouts something and the band switches gears, going full bore into cruel summer, and the girls from behind the bar jump on the stage and dance. I'm dancing now, too, throwing my left arm in the air, trying not to spill the drink in my right hand. I have enough whiskey in my system to let me relax a bit. The band plays on and on, mining the best hits from a bygone era. With each new tune, I scream the words at the top of my lungs, feeling the enmity leave. The crowd melts together into the most raucous sing-along yet. Keep on loving you. I gulp more of my old buddy Jack with its tiny splash of coke for fizz. Let the blessed numbness calm my tortured soul. The band shifts to journey, and I'm believing all right. I'm taken back to our first prom. The whiskey threatens to come up, so I have some more. I'm rocked now, completely drunk. Limbs loose, vision off. On stage, if I'm not mistaken, someone has joined the band and is wearing a codpiece. Ballsy. My shift today was long and sad and full of unhappy people doing stupid things. And tonight, I am trying to disappear into the fabric of the city and let it consume me. I order another drink. I will feel exactly like hell tomorrow. But tonight, tonight I can try to forget. I'm here with my two best friends, Stephen and Jim. We used to be roommates until my undercover gig made it awkward for me and too dangerous for them. I needed room to be by myself, roaming the town as a lone wolf, busting drug dealers and pimps. But I missed the days at the townhouse, the three of us howling at the moon together. Friends are a good thing to have when you're alone. Jim is a patient advocate lawyer, and Stephen is a writer. They're both good at their jobs. Stephen won an award for his debut novel this spring and is writing a new book. And Jim got a partner offer last week. The three of us couldn't be more different. We met in Vanderbilt freshman year in Dr. Tishy's English comp and have been thick as thieves ever since. They got me through the breakup, for which I'm usually grateful. Usually. These two men are good to their cores. I wouldn't be the man I am without them. Though at this moment, their actions are questionable. They are dancing, unsteady and silly, jumping up and down, heads bobbing. Jim is carelessly spilling beer down his arm, soaking his blue Brooks Brothers button down, but he's too drunk to care. Stephen is drinking whiskey like me, but at a slower pace. He has to meet up with family tomorrow and doesn't want to spend the day puking and green. He is sliding around from side to side creating enough space in the crowd to do the moonwalk, the thriller dance, the works. He looks like an idiot. I love him. I love both of them. We are moving as one. The crowd and the guys and the music is pumping, and I'm almost, almost at a place I could call happy when I turn my head to shout at Stephen's antics. And that's when I see her. The world screeches to a halt. The music fades. The room stops heaving. Autumn is here. Autumn Cleary was my first everything. Friend, kiss, car ride, football game, dinner date, blowjob, sex. We met in kindergarten and spent the next 18 years either fighting or kissing, and sometimes both at once. We had plans, man. White picket fences and 2.5 kids and a dog, the whole American dream. But soon after we graduated from college, Autumn broke my heart. It was a clean break. She looked at me one night, 
two weeks before Christmas, when we were getting ready for bed and said, I'm leaving in the morning. I thought you should know, in case you wanted to talk about it. What do you mean you're leaving? On a trip? To where? Brilliant of me, I know. No one ever said I was smart. She sat down on the side of the bed, her blonde hair falling in waves around her shoulders. She'd gotten it cut two days earlier, taking her waist-length hair to a long bob. A lob, she called it. And it was so different. She was so different. She must have seen some sort of recognition of that in my eyes, because she smiled sadly and touched her hair self-consciously. I know it's strange. I needed a change, and this wasn't enough. I need to do something else. I love you. I'll always love you, but I want to be by myself for a while. A desperate wave of fear and hurt and panic started to rise in my chest. I wanted to roar, to scream, to beg and plead. My worst fears were being realized, my very worst nightmares coming alive. Losing Autumn would kill me dead, as sure as a bullet. My heart rattled against my ribs and I took a deep breath, somehow managed to hold the tidal wave at bay. Did I do something? Say something? What in the name of fuck is wrong, Autumn? She smelled of cinnamon. She'd been decorating the apartment. Why would you decorate if you were planning to leave, Autumn? And I had the insane urge to push her down and roll on her body like a dog, get her scent all over me before it was too late. Cinnamon and cloves and lavender and that soap she used on our clothes, the organic stuff that was safe for the environment and smelled like rain. It was a heady perfume, and I didn't want to forget it. Perched on the edge of our big bed, she said the words that tore us asunder. Baby, if I knew the answer, I wouldn't have to leave. Something's wrong. I don't know if it's you or me, but I'm going to give us some space and find out. I don't want to end up like our parents. I refuse to do that. You remember how? Remember? How could I not? Autumn's mom had pretty severe clinical depression one year, got sadder and sadder, and she started to drink, and her dad ignored them both, spent all his time in the basement or the golf course, until her mom finally decided enough was enough and hung herself in the bathroom. Autumn was eight. She never got over it. Not that anyone expected her to. Autumn was still talking. And I don't want that to happen to us. I'd rather remember us as perfect than spend a minute unhappy. You're unhappy? I'd whispered, confused, so confused. Yeah, I think I am. She'd reached out a hand and grabbed mine. Her long white fingers, so elegant and soft against my blunt ones. You're not happy either. You just don't want to admit it. Trust me, this is for the best. Then she drew me down and kissed me, and we made love, hard and wet and furious and desperate, and in the morning, when I woke up, she was gone. My soul was broken in two, and nothing, nothing could ever fix it. All I've dreamed about for the past seven years is finding her again, holding her in my arms, warm and fragrant, having the life I'd always envisioned, the one where we're together with our kids and our dog, our happy, perfect dream. It was always us against the world. And here she is. She's standing by the door, a drink in her hand. As far as I know, she hasn't been back to Nashville since she left. She wasn't close to her dad after her mom's death, had bounced around her girlfriend's houses and mine until she moved in with me permanently sophomore year of college, our first apartment. I assume she still has friends here. No one speaks Autumn's name to me, ever. It is an understanding I have with my whole world. We were the most likely couple. Prom king and queen, most likely to get married, most likely to get pregnant in college, everything. When we broke up, it was like a bubble of hope and comfort burst for everyone who knew us. Everyone hates her for what she did to me, how she left me. All of a sudden, 
with no real warning and no real explanations. No one understands what happened, least of all me. From what little I know, Autumn has gotten on with her life. I haven't, not really. Don't think I've lived a monk for seven years. There have been other women. None have touched my soul the way Autumn did. No one ever will. Face it, I'm a heartbroken asshole who can't get over his first love. A first love who is now moving toward me. Almost like she's making sure I see her. She's getting closer. Is she going to come over here and talk to me? Panic rises in me. I have the insane urge to run away. I don't know what I'll do if she tries to talk to me. I'm torn between hugging her and hitting her, which is a very bad way to feel when I've consumed half a bottle of Jack. I'm not a volatile guy, but this woman ruined me. Breathe. 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 She's watching me. She looks sad, thin. The blonde hair is even shorter now than when I saw her last. It grazes her chin, the front longer than the back, the ends flipping toward me like a ski jump. Stephen and Jim notice me staring away from the stage. Stephen says, Dude, what is your damage? Autumn. I manage to spit out. Jim overhears this news, sobers immediately, and puts a hand on my arm as if to hold me back. He cranes his neck to see over the crowd. Where? I don't see her. By the door. Her hair's short. I still don't see her. I'm going over. Shit, no, don't stay here. If anyone should go over, it's me. Autumn is still staring at me. I take one step toward her, ignoring the cries of my friends. Another. Then, a big guy wearing a flannel shirt and Doc Martin steps to her side. She smiles up at him, gratefully, I think, casts one last glance at me, almost as if she wants to be sure I'm watching, and leaves with the lumberjack. Autumn leaves. She walks out without saying anything to me, and I am struck dumb and nearly blind by the pain. The guys shuffle me over to the bar, dump me on a stool covered in questionable stains, and shove another drink in my hand. Seconds later, it is gone, and another replaces it. One of them asks, You okay, dude? Did you see her? I choke out. Who was that douche she left with? I am slurring. I am making no sense. Stephen's eyes are grave. I didn't see her, man. Me neither, Jim adds. She must have chickened out when she saw you. I didn't know she was back in town. I thought I would have heard. If anyone would have, it was Jim. He'd always had his finger on the pulse of our crowd, and his girlfriend, Joy, had been Autumn's best friend back in the day. They'd kept in touch for a few years, probably more, but I'd asked not to be informed when they heard from her. It hurt too damn much. Stephen is looking at me with concern. You're pretty fucked up. Maybe we should bail. You stay. I want to be alone. I manage to stand up, though my legs are wobbly. I hear Jim murmur, Is he carrying? And Stephen say, Is he ever not? And Jim comes to my side and says quietly, The word a demand. Gun. A pretty girl with wads of blonde dreadlocks whips her head around. A wave of patchouli stings my nose. She's gone white instantly terrified, is staring at Jim, ready to spring away to save herself. Fun, Jim yells, waving her off, then walks me to the door. I see Stephen eyeing patchouli. He's always gone for the hippie types. Good, I like it when he's occupied. He'll go home with the girl instead of sleeping on my couch. I wasn't kidding when I said I want to be alone right now. Down the stairs, out the doors, Half the crowd is out on the sidewalk and balcony smoking. I slur my way into bombing one. Jim helps me light it, then he walks me into the parking lot. He makes sure we're alone. I use a vintage beetle covered in stickers to hold myself up. He points to my ankle holster, hidden beneath my jeans and boot. Do you need to leave them with me? No, no reason to. There's more where that came from. Not funny, dude. I don't want you doing anything stupid. You're a good friend, man. 
I slap at his chest, missing, hitting his bicep instead. Yeah, I'm good. I'm gonna walk. Walk it off. Jim looks worried. He's thinking he should make sure I get home in one piece. Don't worry, I tell him. I'm a grown man. I've grown up, man. This strikes me as funny and I start to giggle. Jim purses his lips like a teacher about to scold me, and it sets me off in gales of laughter. He rolls his eyes. He's not sober, not by a long shot, or else he'd never send me off alone. But I am in luck. He's drunk enough to let me go. Okay, tough guy. Call me in the morning. Don't be a dummy. Walk straight home. Don't drink anything more. Yes, Mom. I will not pass go. I will not collect $200. I will not eat pancakes with the fox. I will not linger with the locks. You're a fucking idiot. Jim starts to say something else, then squeezes my shoulder and heads back inside. It feels good to be alone. A chick in angel wings and thigh-high boots walks past me, smoking. Hey, can I buy your pack off you? She gives me a look, then tosses it to me. Looks like you need them more than me. Merry Christmas, Biatch. I nod gratefully. Merry fucking Christmas, indeed. I head toward Broadway, past Cummins Station, giving it a dirty look as I go. They're ruining the historical building, and it hurts to see my town growing and changing the way it has in the past few years. We're being overrun. I think the crane-to-person ratio is at an all-time high. They have t-shirts with cranes in the Nashville skyline now. We have totally jumped the shark with all the new construction. Soon enough, it will be a ghost town again. The new building's only partially full because the millennials are getting knocked up and moving to the suburbs for better schools. Wax and wane, the story of any city. When I pass the frist and step onto the sidewalk on Broadway, I realize I don't want to be out anymore. Seeing the changes is going to depress me. I want to go home, climb into bed, pass out, say goodbye to this fuck-awful night. I turn back, swing over to Demumbrin, walk down 11th, barely keeping my balance on the decline. My apartment is in the gulch, a one-way alley behind Bar Louie and the pub. I'm right in the midst of the action, and it's usually packed with people, but tonight it's empty, quiet, eerie. One brave soul is out walking her dog, a big-ass illusion something that I've seen around before. I give her a little wave, then head into my building. My apartment is cold and quiet. I grab a beer from the fridge and sit down, hard on the couch. I slug down the beer, toss the can toward the kitchen, then half fall, half roll onto my side, cheek against the cheap leather. The lights outside blink incessantly, and I put my hand over my eyes. Autumn. Even the thought of her name sends a spike of pain through my body so intense it numbs me. And then I'm gone. Gone. Spinning and drifting and trying like hell to get her out of my mind, slipping into sleep when I hear a voice, soft and elegant, saying my name over and over like a prayer. Zachary. 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 I open my eyes and she's there, sitting on the coffee table. Autumn looks sad, but she's alone. God, I am so drunk I'm manifesting my ex-girlfriend in my living room. What was in that whiskey? Zach, wake up. And bonus, she talks too. Great. Okay, maybe this is a dream. Maybe it's a dream come true. I sit up, wiping my lips. I taste awful. Cigarettes and beer and whiskey. She smells good, like cinnamon and cloves. Yep, it's a dream. I'm going to wake up with my hand wrapped around my cock like I do so often when I dream about autumn. I play along. Autumn? Hey. She reaches over and brushes a strand of my too long hair off my forehead. She used to do that when we were together, and she's done it in all the dreams I've had of her since. Except, this isn't a dream. I sit bolt upright and scramble back into the couch. Jesus Christ, you're here. How'd you find me? Calm down. I followed you from the bar. You left your door unlocked. 
for a cop, you aren't very cautious. She looks around, smiling. This is a nice place. I'm surprised you live alone. The guys were sick of me. I meant without a girlfriend or a wife. Silence. She smiles again. Her hand drops back into her lap. She's sitting on the coffee table facing me, smiling and talking. And I can't decide whether I've gone round the bend or she's actually here. I'm glad, she says. I would have been jealous. You don't have the right to be jealous, not about this. She nods, her hair flipping with the movement. You're right, I don't. Honestly, I'd be happier if you did have someone. I wouldn't feel as bad about everything. Oh, you mean bailing on me, on us, on our life and plans? Now you feel bad? I stand up, brushing past her and go into the kitchen. My apartment is pretty nice. Reclaimed wood, exposed brick, lots of glass. The kitchen is a decent size. I like to cook, like to nest. Autumn gave me those gifts. She showed me how important it was to have a home, not a place to crash at night. I grab another beer from the fridge, slam the door. She's watching me. With a sigh, I gesture to the beer. She nods. I hand it to her. Our hands brush, and it's like a lightning strike. I jump back and move to a stool at my breakfast bar, keeping 15 feet between us. Why are you here? I wanted to see you, and... You don't get to make arbitrary decisions with my life anymore, Autumn. Showing up out of the blue isn't cool. She ignores my interruption. And say that I'm sorry. I shouldn't have left. It was a dumb mistake made by a dumb kid who didn't know herself very well. You deserved better. Deserve better. I am so sorry, Zach. I know you are furious with me, and you should be. But I couldn't let things end on such a horrible note. I had to tell you how much I miss you, how sad I've been without you. I am floored by this speech, floored and angry. Seven years, and now you decide to show up and throw this at me. My dad died. Did you know? No. It was a couple of years after I left. He didn't want a funeral or anything, was cremated. I came back for the ashes, drove around. I'd been miserable since I left. I wanted to come back. I went by your place with the guys that night. You were with someone, a girl with black hair, on the front porch. You were smiling, holding her hand. You seemed happy. I didn't want to ruin it for you. She meant nothing. How was I supposed to know that? She's being snappish, and I almost laugh. Almost. What would you have done if I was alone that night? I would have thrown myself on the floor at your feet and begged you to take me back. The pain of this admission is almost too much to bear. So you disappeared again, didn't even bother to try and reach out? Yeah, I went back to Austin, that's where I am now, outside of Austin, and tried to get on with my life. Dated a couple of guys, nothing serious. I couldn't get you out of my head. That moment in time with you holding another girl's hand? Who was she? Honestly, I have no idea. No one's ever mattered to me but you. She sighs then, and it's a happy sound. A sigh of relief, I think. I'm glad to hear that. I've missed you so much. I felt so stupid, and I didn't know how to come back, how to ask for forgiveness. And then time passed. The days went faster and faster. I got a job I liked, met some friends, real friends. I told myself you were in my past. That Austin held my future. I was wrong. I was so wrong. Without you, I have no future. She begins to cry, soft and gentle. I go to her without thought, pull her into my arms. She feels so thin, so insubstantial. It's weird, but I figure it's been seven years, and I've had a lot to drink. And besides, this is a whopper of a dream. I've changed my mind. It is a dream. So I tuck her head under my chin and hold on tighter. It doesn't take long for her to stop crying. She raises her head and looks up at me with those intense blue eyes. I do the only thing I know to do. I touch my lips to hers, gently at first. But when her arms go around my waist and she sinks into the kiss, I let go. 
Seven years of pain and fury and love and fear and loneliness go into that kiss. It is epic. We have never kissed this way before, as if we know stopping will untether us forever. She's small, Autumn, and I easily scoop her into my arms and carry her to my bed, all without breaking the kiss. Her shirt buttons down the front, and they come free with a single pinch. The soft cotton slips back over her pure white shoulders. She isn't wearing a bra, and my hands find the warmth of her breasts. She has the buttons on my jeans undone now, and I am inching hers down. I don't want to rush, it's been so long. But she's yanking down the fabric, running her hands along my thighs and grabbing a hold of me. She breaks the kiss with a gasp and drops to her knees. Soft, so soft. I gather her hair in my hand and do everything in my power not to give up. Not yet. She laughs when she feels me tense, and that sends me over the edge. I pull her up, stumble backward to the bed with her in my arms, my lips locked on her again. She wraps her legs around me and slides onto me. Time stops. There is something about the way we fit together when we're making love that I'd never experienced with another woman. I've also never dreamed about it. This feeling, this sensation that I'm buried in the depths of the universe, hasn't happened since the night she left me. My hands are in her hair, and she's going faster and faster until we're both out of control. It lasts a long time. I am not ready to give up, to give in. I want this to go on forever. The sky is lightening when Autumn untangles herself from me and goes to the bag she left on the coffee table. We haven't slept a wink. I am sore and she is sore, and we've laughed and loved together for hours. She's back. She's back with me. And I am complete once more. I watch her small body cross the room. Get back here, I say, but she shakes her head. I can't. I have to go back. To Texas? Not without me. She drags on her jeans and her top, steps into her shoes. She returns to the bed, sits on the edge. I feel the familiar horror of the situation, know the happiness we've shared tonight is about to come to an end. Don't leave. God, Autumn, don't leave me again. She leans over and kisses me, fragrant and lovely. When she draws back, she's no longer smiling. There's something I have to do. This is not over, you and I, I promise. She reaches into her leather bag and draws out a watch. It is a nice watch, a dark blue face with heavy silver links. There is a logo on the top, but I don't recognize the brand. I want you to wear this until I get back. Promise me, you won't take it off. It's important, Zach. You can't take it off. Hey, you haven't given me a gift in a long time. I won't ever take it off. I take the watch and snap it onto my wrist. It is a perfect fit. She looks relieved, as if she were worried the watch wouldn't fit or I wouldn't like it. And it's a little weird that she's making me promise not to take it off. But I love this woman, and it seems like a simple request. If it makes her happy, I'll comply. But I don't want her to go. Give me a minute to pack a bag and I'll go with you. She hugs me hard and long, then steps back. I have to do this alone. I love you, Zach. Always have. Always will. She heads toward the door. I'm out of the bed now, striding after her. Wait. She has her hand on the doorknob. She turns and blows me a kiss. I'll see you soon. Promise. And the door shuts behind her. The sun is coming up in earnest now. There are flashes on the sterile buildings opposite me. The intense glare of glass and metal makes me squint. I run my fingers over my lips, glance at the watch. I feel good, better than I have in years. I check the time on the watch against my phone. It's almost 7 a.m. I have three missed calls, all from the past hour. I guess I turned the ringer off when we went to bed, or maybe when I got home. Whatever, Jim and Stephen both have called to check on me. 
I go into the kitchen, make a cup of coffee, take it with me to the bedroom. The sheets are rumpled. The room smells of autumn. The weight of the watch is heavy on my wrist. It wasn't a dream. She was actually here. She loves me. I wish she hadn't run out of here like she needed to do the walk of shame. But the things we talked about in the night come back to me. I trust her. She said she'll be back, and I'm sure she will. All is right in the world, or it will be as soon as I have her in my arms again. My phone rings, Jim, yet again. This time I answer. Dude, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm... Shut up and listen to me. I don't know what the hell is going on, but I got a call. Autumn Cleary is missing. Yeah, about that. She was here most of the night. She followed me home from the bar, felt bad, wanted to talk and other things. There was silence. What? Don't even tell me I shouldn't have done it. She followed me home, man. We're getting back together. Zach, she lives in Texas. She went missing from a bar last night, in Austin. I know, she told me that she lives in Austin, I mean. She wasn't in Nashville. She was in Austin last night. Then she drives like a bat out of hell to get here so fast. Dude, you aren't hearing me. She went missing at midnight, walked to the bathroom, didn't come back. Her friends are going wild. I suddenly have a headache and the pain pulses like a gong. But that's impossible. We saw her at midnight. She was at the Mercy Lounge with that big motherfucker. Silence again. We didn't see her, man, and you were really drunk. This is ridiculous. There's been a mistake. I saw her clear as day, and she's been here for hours. She gave me a watch, for God's sake, an apology watch. I tap the metal. Yes, the watch is very real. Someone's made a mistake. I am repeating myself as if saying it multiple times will make it true. I don't have any other words. Can't think any other thoughts. There must be a mistake. I think I should come over. Jim said in the tone he usually reserves for the mentally ill clients he represents. The watch catches the light from the sunrise, sending graceful beams dancing across the apartment. This is too weird for me, man. There's some sort of mistake. Zach, it's all over the internet. She's some sort of bigwig in Austin now. Does merchandising for a record company that has all kinds of musicians through here. The label has put up a reward for news of her. What are you saying? I don't know, man. You tell me. You claim you saw her. You spent time talking, but at the same time, in another state, 12 hours away, she was hanging out with some girlfriends at a bar and went missing. She couldn't get here that fast. There's no way. And she can't be in two places at once. Something's not right. No kidding. Fine, whatever. Come over. I'll prove she was here. I hang up. Either I'm losing my mind, or... No. That's not possible. Not at all. I ran a hand across my mouth. The taste of her lingers on my lips. I flip open my laptop, scroll to Google News. My heart stops, literally skips and stops beating. I suck in a breath and refresh the page, my heart hammering as fast as a thoroughbred's hooves thundering down a racetrack. The picture of Autumn is current, based on what I saw last night. The haircut, the impossibly big blue eyes, the thin frame, the tender smile. Above it, in huge 24-point font, the headline screams, Austin Woman Missing. I shake my head. This is impossible. She was here. There is no question in my mind that Autumn spent the night in my apartment, in my bed, in my arms. I am a police officer. I am a logical, realistic human being. The love of my life spent the night in my apartment, but she also is missing from her hometown. What if it wasn't really her? What if Jim's right? An eerie sense of loss fills me as I do the math. There's only one way a woman could be in two places at once, and Autumn couldn't be a ghost. Could she? The news of Autumn's disappearance goes national two days later, when the Austin police find a traffic cam that shows her walking out of the bar, down the street, and disappearing into the night. Moments later, 
a tan Camry can be seen peeling away from the dark spot in the video. The police surmise she either got into the car willingly or was forced into it by an assailant. There are bolos out on the car, but without a license plate, it's going to be hard narrowing it down. All the sex offenders are being checked on, par for the course when a young woman goes missing. So far, there is nothing. Autumn has vanished into thin air. I've been trying to work, but my heart isn't in it. I can't get my mind off the blonde goddess who'd visited me Christmas night. The things she'd said. The way she'd moved. The feeling of her lips pressed against mine, her legs wrapped around my waist. She hasn't been back, but I am still wearing the watch she gave me and begged me not to take off. There are many strange things about our time together, yes. But I am in pretty hefty denial until Stephen and Jim sit me down and force me to watch the time-stamped video. Seeing the incontrovertible evidence makes me break down and admit they are right. I have to trust the forensics. Everything from witness statements to fingerprints to DNA swabs to this video is telling me that Autumn was in Austin on Christmas night. So how the hell was she with me? Have I finally lost my mind? Been driven crazy by grief? Did I have some sort of acid trip flashback? I swear to God the woman was with me, in my apartment, in my living room, in my bed. I am wearing the watch she gave me. Nothing makes sense. I'm a rational guy. Yes, I was drunk, totally wasted drunk. But I have a tangible item on my wrist. Proof that she's been to my place. There is only one other explanation, and I don't think I rolled someone on my way home from Mercy Lounge on Christmas night. I am slowly coming to grips with the idea that maybe, just maybe, something I can't explain is happening. The guys treat me like I'm some sort of mental patient for the next couple of days. The search for Autumn is heating up. Autumn's friends are all over television, doing very serious, heartfelt interviews, and still there is nothing. Time keeps passing. A week into the search, on New Year's Eve, the 24-7 news cycle finds another juicy murder story to latch onto, and Autumn Cleary disappears from television sets nationwide as well. Though I'm not really in the mood, I agree to go out on New Year's Eve with Stephen and Jim. We start the night in awkward silence, have a couple of drinks at my place, then walk down to Lower Broad and watch the guitar drop. It is cold and dreary, the sky is overcast, the early dark oppressive. I can smell snow. Usually New Year's in Lowbro is a blast, but I'm not feeling it. There is a sense of dread hanging over the evening. Nothing seems right. I can't have fun. Not when I don't know what's happened to Autumn. I am back at my apartment by 12.30 a.m., sober as a judge. The TV on, but muted, staring out the window at the chilly night, thinking, again. I'd like to think Autumn and I have some sort of connection, that even though we haven't seen each other in seven years, I'd know if she were in trouble or hurt or dead. I can't help but obsess about her visit. Since there are no rational explanations, I finally allow myself to think in less realistic terms. If she were a ghost, and she appeared to me, that means she must be dead. The very idea squeezes my heart and makes my breath come short. Losing her all over again is killing me. Excepting I am probably on my way to a straitjacket, I take the watch off my wrist and stare at it. I don't know anything about watches, except they tell time. This is a nice timepiece, not gaudy. It looks expensive. I pull out my phone and finally Google the brand. Tog Hoyer. Shit. These fuckers are expensive. Where in the world did Autumn come up with the money to buy me a gift like this? I turn it over and realize the back is engraved. I feel a little better now. She got it used. I'm glad. I wouldn't feel comfortable knowing she'd spent six months' rent on a present for me. Engraved in the silver back is a stylized star, and inside its borders, there is a monogram with the initials TWH. The W is bigger than the other two. It must be the last name. T is the first. 
H, the middle. I wonder who owned the watch before, why they gave it up, where she found it. Do ghosts wear watches? Do they need to tell time? I don't know. If I were going to spend eternity floating through life, I don't think I'd want a watch constantly reminding me of time's never-ending passage. I put it back on my wrist, try to wrap my head around my thought process. If she's a ghost, she's dead, and the last thing she did was bring me a present. Not only the watch. She gave me forgiveness. She gave me love, her body. She gave me closure. And I finally understand what's happened. She is gone. But she found a way to let me know she still loved me and regretted what happened between us. I can't believe what a gift Autumn has given me. Despite myself, I start to cry. I have to find out where she is, what happened to her. She's counting on me, I know she is. And then it hits me. The watch isn't a present. It's a clue. Day 10 after Autumn went missing, I take a few days of vacation, happily sanctioned by my boss, who is, rightly so, concerned about me getting myself shot on the streets if I don't get my head back into the game. I drive to Austin fast. It takes me a little over 12 hours with two breaks. This is even more confirmation I had some sort of drunken vision the night Autumn disappeared. There's no way she could have gotten to me in the time frame we're talking about. Not as a human, that is. I've never been to Austin before. It reminds me of Nashville. Thumping music downtown, Tony neighborhoods, restaurants galore. My GPS takes me to police headquarters on 8th Street, and I go inside, show my badge, and ask to speak to the detective working Autumn's case, Mario Torres. He comes out of the bullpen immediately, hand outstretched. Torres is a big guy, barrel-chested with jet-black hair and a luxurious mustache. When he speaks, it is with a sense of contained joviality. He reminds me of one of the sergeants I work with in Nashville, Bob Parks. I'm Torres. You Aki? Yes, call me Zack. Zack, don't know how much help I can give you. This is a local case, you know. But come on back, let's chat. Torres is humoring me as a fellow cop, and I can't say I blame him one bit. It's not usual for cops from other jurisdictions, other states, to come in on a case without first being asked and without anything to add to the mix. We walk by a break room and he gestures to the coffee pot. I nod and he pours me a cup, thick and black. I dump in four sugars. I need the boost. I am tired. So tired. He leads me to his desk, pulls me up a chair, and drops a pin on a clean yellow legal pad. So, Zach, tell me what Austin PD can do for you now that you've come all the way from Nashville. I take it you used to date Miss Cleary? Go careful, Zach. That's right. We broke up several years ago. I take a deep breath. This is going to sound crazy, but I saw Autumn in Nashville Christmas night, around the same time that she went missing, as a matter of fact. Torres leans forward, his dark eyes searching mine. I can tell exactly what he's thinking, which he confirms a second later. Is there something you need to tell me, Zack? Boom. In one fell swoop, I've made myself a suspect in her disappearance. Yes, there is, but it's not what you think. I'm not here to confess. I didn't have anything to do with her disappearance. I'd never hurt Autumn. I love her, man. Torres's voice is thoughtful. He unconsciously plays with the snap on his cuffs. Afraid I'm a bit confused, partner. This is going to sound absolutely insane, and if you toss me out on my ear or throw me in the pokey, I will completely understand. But roll with me. I'm listening. About an hour after Autumn was seen on the video, she showed up in my apartment in Nashville. I sit back in my chair and take a drink of the now-cooled coffee. It is terrible. I set the cup down and wait for Torres to either cuff me or kick me out. Instead, he's looking at me with undisguised curiosity. What do you think this means, Zach? In for a penny, in for a pound, as my grandmother used to say. I think Autumn's ghost came to visit me. And I think she's given me a clue about where I can find her. I know it sounds crazy, but she was in my apartment. We were together for several hours and she gave me a really expensive watch before she left. 
Torres is staring at me like I'm going to bite him. Wow, uh, that's... Oh, it's definitely time for me to leave. I stand up. I get it. Sorry, forget I was ever here. Sit down, dummy. He gestures toward the chair, and I'm startled by his tone. He sounds almost friendly. I sit. I have nothing left to do. You say she touched you? He asks. Yes, several times. She'd done a hell of a lot more than touch me, but I wasn't going to tell a stranger I'd had sex with a ghost. And she gave you a watch. I unsnap it from my wrist and hand it over. He looks at it, gives it back. Amazing. And he means it. I can't help feeling surprised. You believe me? You're talking to a guy who celebrates Dia de los Muertos. Of course I believe you. No idea what you just said, man. I took French in high school. Idiot, he replies companionably. Dia de los Muertos is the day of the dead. The first of November, the day after Halloween, we celebrate our ancestors who are no longer with us. The whole idea is to encourage a visit from them, to see them again. So yeah, I believe in ghosts. I must look shocked because Torres starts to laugh. Dude, I'm Catholic and descended from Mayans. I believe in most everything from miracles to visitations. He stops smiling, and his voice is gentler now. I'm sorry that things are shaking out like this. Because if she's a ghost, she's... My chest squeezes tight. Yeah, I'd figured out that part for myself. Unlike you, I don't believe in this stuff, so I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around it. I mean, we broke up years ago, and we haven't talked or seen each other since. I'm kind of flattered she came to me. You're a cop, dude. She probably assumed you would try to investigate and find her body. That's what cops do, you know. Yeah, I figured that part out too, so here I am. What can I do to help? Torres is staring at my wrist. Let me see that again. I hand over the watch. My wrist feels cold without it there. There's an engraving on the back. Initials. Torres flips the watch over, puts on his glasses, holds the watch under the lamp. Hey, he's older than me. Not everyone can have cat vision. I'm about to make a joke about detectives and magnifying glasses when he turns white and lets off with a string of what I assume are curses in Spanish. He jumps up out of his seat. What is it? Come with me. Wait, you recognize this? He doesn't answer, marches toward the hall like a bull charging a red cape. I follow, heart starting to beat a rapid tattoo. We bolt up a flight of stairs to the third floor and down a long hallway into the quiet executive offices of the Austin PD. Ignoring the protests of the chief's young secretary, Torres opens the door and strides into his boss's office. The guy who I assume is Chief Acevedo is in a meeting with three men in suits. They all look surprised, which is no wonder, considering the way Torres is advancing on them. He gets to the desk, tosses the watch to the chief who catches it. Torres practically growls. I know where Autumn Cleary is. On the last of the omen days, Epiphany, we drive west in a caravan of cars and trucks. It is before dawn in the darkest hours of the night. The Texas skies are crystal clear, and out here, there are no lights, no city brightness to hide the stars. I don't think I've ever seen anything like it, this vast openness, the constellations easily discernible. Stars litter the sky, diamonds cast onto a black velvet canvas. The brightest star, Sirius, seems to have a halo of light around it. Polaris is to my right, giving me perspective on our travels. I'm queasy, worrying about what we might find. SWAT is already in position. They've been watching the ranch for the past 24 hours, trying to determine if Thomas Holden Winchester III is on site. Winchester, it turns out, is a young guy who comes from some serious oil money. His grandfather was a famous wildcatter and struck oil on what is now their extensive property. Winchester II continued the tradition, but went missing a few years back. According to Torres, there have always been rumors that he was killed by his kid and dumped down a well on the property, 
but Austin PD never had any proof and they couldn't get warrants to search. Torres gives me the rest of the rundown as we drive. T.H. Winchester, as he's known, is rich and ruthless. There's always been this thing about him maybe bumping off dear old dad, but we also think he's running coke in from Mexico. He's funding the coyotes who bring illegals across the border. They come in near Laredo, and Winchester's people drive him to the ranch with the drugs. On his property, they can find food and shelter, but the price is hefty. No drugs and you're dead. Considering the number of illegals we have coming through here, I'd say they're happy to pay the price. And you haven't arrested him for it? It's a hard situation. We haven't been able to get close enough to catch him in the act. And with a guy who has this much money, nothing less than the proverbial hand in the cookie jar will do. But you were able to get a warrant easily this time. Why? Judge Crater is hard on kidnapping. Had a daughter killed when she was a teenager. Body showed up after a few weeks on the side of the road, dumped. She'd been killed elsewhere. How? Strangled? Raped? He paused. She had some broken bones. The works. Do you know who did it? Nope, not officially. And Torres goes quiet. A meaningful silence. He watches me with his dark eyes made black by the empty sky waiting for me to put the pieces together. Are you telling me Winchester might be involved in the crater murder? He looks out the window. I'm telling you that there are a fair number of girls who have gone missing from this area over the past ten years. Five have shown up again on the side of the road, broken and strangled like Crater's daughter Rose. The other three are still missing. Is Autumn one of the three? Yes. I take a deep breath, try to swallow the bile rising in my throat. We're talking a serial killer? In my opinion, yes. The cases have been documented in VICAP. A couple of FBI profilers gave us some leads a few years back. I never bought their profile. One of the women was from Vermont, so they think it's a truck driver dropping bodies during a long haul. I disagree. Whoever's been doing this is smart and local. Crater's daughter is the only victim who was a native. The rest of the women were all transplants to the area, without family nearby. I've always thought T.H. was involved. Call it a gut instinct. And now you have his watch, which we can't explain. Well, we have one explanation. Your ex managed to get it to you the night she went missing. Let's pray it's not too late. Word has gone around about the way Torres and I came up with a suspect. The Austin cops seem nonplussed by the idea that a ghost visited me and gave me a watch belonging to her murderer. I'm thinking, if they are this open-minded and I ever need a change of scenery, Austin might not be a bad place to work. The thing about T.H., Torres continues, is he won't go easy. We're T-minus ten minutes to the ranch. I want you out of the way and out of the fray. I don't argue. This is their rodeo. I'm lucky they've let me ride along, considering the tie I have to the case. Torres's phone rings. He answers it, listens, then hangs up and smiles, mean and sinister. He is a different man, one primed for action, serious and deadly. I am suddenly glad he's on my side. SWAT confirms T.H. is on the property. They spied him walking to the barn. He smacks me on the shoulder. It's gonna be our lucky day. It might be their lucky day. All I know is there's a better than average chance I'm going to see the love of my life dead and broken. And I don't know if I want that image of her to be my last. Suck it up, Aki. If Autumn can manage to cross the veil to give you a clue, the least you can do is face whatever she went through to do it. The sun is breaking in the east when we drive through the gates of the ranch. I'm not used to the openness of the land here, the vastness, the flat scrub brush and shifting sands. It feels too big, like there's no way we'll find a small woman like Autumn. I swallow back the fear and frustration and hear a series of gunshots, small arms fire. Torres is on his phone immediately. What happened? What's going on, son of a bitch? He slaps the cover closed and jacks around into his Glock. SWAT had to engage. TH saw them and ran. He launches a volley of rapid-fire Spanish at the driver, a guy named Hernandez, and the man veers off the main road. A choking plume of dust follows us into the field. Where are we going? 
coming around back. Maybe we'll get lucky and he's fleeing this way. I rearrange myself to look out the window. Adrenaline has started pumping through my system. I pull the thirty-eight from my ankle holster. Torres watches impassively. Sorry, man, but I'm not walking in there unarmed. He nods, reaches over the back seat, and yanks out a vest. Put this on. I don't want to be responsible for you getting dead, not on my watch. I shrug into the bulletproof vest and keep watch out the window as we bump and slide through the scrub. This is happening, and all my thoughts are for Autumn. Torres hands me a monocular. I jam it to my eye and start scanning the landscape. There, I say, pointing. Dust rising to the south. Hernandez jerks the wheel and we plot an intercept course. Torres is shouting into his phone. After a few minutes, the dust plume stops. He's gone on foot, I call, but I see quickly that I'm wrong. There is a maze of buildings in the middle of this emptiness. Barns. I catch a glimpse of lush green lands in front of us. There is a small lake, marshy with cattails and scrub. Out here, they only water the land they need to keep the stock alive, Torres says in explanation. Winchester's always kept horses, thoroughbreds. He races them, likes being the big playboy at the track. SWAT is coming. They want us to stay put. Hernandez pulls the truck over to the side of the road, 100 yards from the barn. We wait. I am jittery and holding the gun too tightly in my hand. My knuckles are white. I release my fingers, try to relax. Torres stiffens next to me and swears. Did you see that? The fucker ran through the corral. Hernandez says, SWAT's five minutes away. She could be in there, I say, and my hand is on the door, and then I'm out, into the chill, onto the marshy land, my legs pumping as I run toward the barns. Torres is right behind me, saying things in Spanish I assume aren't complimentary. We run low and fast, trying to avoid getting ourselves shot. When we draw closer, he grabs my arm and steps in front of me, starts signaling with his left hand. Go around the front, his gestures say. I will cover you. I move slowly this time, my feet touching the ground lightly and quickly as I move to the entrance of the main building. There are six outbuildings. The bastard could be in any of them. Torres signals he's going right. I should go left. I do. I step into the barn, hugging the wall. There are horses. I can hear them nickering, and the air is redolent with manure. There is a long cement channel in front of me, tack hanging on the walls, the stall doors shut all the way down. The hair rises on my arms. I am not alone. I can feel the eyes on me. I dive to the left a second before the bullet hits the spot I was standing in. Torres ducks right, behind the door to one of the sixteen stalls in the barn. I hear trucks and shouts. SWAT has arrived to save the day, but I know how they work. Set perimeters. Assess the situation. Time. 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 I don't want to be a hero, but I don't want to wait for hours either. The bullet came from above me. I'll be safer with the horses. I run down the row, find the first empty stall, throw myself over the top, and land hard in fresh straw. But I am alone. And alive. Turning back to the cement interior, I scan the area I've run from. I have a new perspective on the barn's entrance. There is a ladder by the door. A hayloft. He must be up there. There's only one way to do this. Using the stall door as a cover, I swing it open gently. A shot hits the wood. And another. And another. But now he's given his position away. I can see him. T.H. Winchester has red hair. He looks like a strawberry in the hay. He ducks his head back in and shoots again. But it's too late for him. I step from behind the door and I don't hesitate. I walk forward, aiming for the spot I've seen him disappear into, hoping the flash of white and red I saw a second earlier is his forehead. I squeeze the trigger, and a muffled thud tells me I found my mark. I shoot again, and once more. Winchester falls out of the loft at my feet, dead. It is over, less than three minutes after it started. Torres is there, pressing fingers into Winchester's neck, knowing already there will be no heartbeat. He looks up at me with genuine respect. Nice shooting. Yeah. My hands are strangely cold. 
I've never killed anyone before. And now I've shot a man without ever saying a word to him in anger or curiosity or fear. He is dead, and I am glad. Is that him? I manage. It is. Torres still has his gun out. I need to tell SWAT and my boss what's happening before they come in here cocked and loaded. And we need to search this place. You talk, I'll search. You sure, man? His dark eyes are full of concern, but I nod. I'd rather be the one who finds her. Listen, stay here a minute. Let me brief them on what went down, then we'll do it together. I nod. But the minute his back is turned, I start down the row of stalls again. There is a reason Winchester fled to this place. There is something here of value to him, something he wanted to protect. Seven of the stalls have horses, spooked and stomping and white-eyed, all freaked by the shootings. The eighth confirms my deepest fears. I open the stall door, and I see her in the gloom, on her back, her empty face staring at the heavens. Autumn! She doesn't answer, and I realize life as I know it is over. She is dead, lying in the hay in the thoroughbred stall, her legs bent at a strange angle, as if she tried to ride one of the horses to safety, but fell off. Or Winchester left her that way, arranged her awkwardly, as if he'd used her, then forgotten her. I want to shoot him again, but I leave him to Torres and his crew and go to Autumn's side, stealing myself. It's been twelve days since she went missing. I expect there to be a strong stench around her. And while I catch the scent of ammonia and feces, there is no decomposition. Her face is so white, I can see the veins running under her skin. She is thin, so thin. Oh God, I pray, not knowing any more words. Oh God. And her eyes focus. Her head turns toward me. She looks at me, and something like love flits across her face. Is she a spirit? Her mouth moves. Zack, she whispers. Dear God, she's alive. She's alive, I scream, running to the stall window. Torres, she's alive. We need a medevac, stat. Shouts go up around the ranch. I fall to my knees by Autumn's side. Her face is bruised from a beating, and it must hurt to do it, but she smiles. Zack, I knew you'd come. Her voice is torn and thick, like she hasn't had water in a very long time. I'm here, baby, I'm here. You're safe now. Can you get up? I want to get you out of here. And it hits me, the way her legs are splayed. So unnatural, so odd. Her back is broken. He has broken her back so she can't run away. Rage fills me. I am so glad I was the one to kill him. I am so glad I've taken some small measure of revenge for us both. I can't walk, she whispers, but her hand snakes up and touches my forehead, brushes back the hair from my eyes. He made sure I couldn't walk, first thing. Don't worry, Zack. It doesn't even hurt. That's okay, baby. That's okay. I'll carry you. I'll always carry you. We're both crying, and I hear the whoomp, whoomp, whoomp of a helicopter's rotors. Seven years ago, I lost the love of my life, and now I have found her. She is cradled carefully, gently in my arms, pale and still, broken in two, but breathing her chest lifting lightly. Autumn is alive, and I don't know what to think about anything anymore. The sun is shining, masking the bitter cold outside. I didn't know Texas could get so cold, but I'm wearing a North Face fleece and damn glad I packed it, because it's colder than a witch's tit down here. The omen days are over. There has been a requisite rebirth, the season's requirements are met. My life has changed, altered. I will never be the same again. Autumn is still in the hospital in Austin, but is better, much better. The break was lower than we first thought. 
and the doctors think the damage to her spinal cord is temporary, that she'll be able to walk again. She's already getting feeling back in her toes. They think the trauma of the broken vertebrae caused swelling, and that's what's shutting off the signals to her brain that her feet really do work. It's a miracle. Torres finally told me the details of the other bodies they'd found. They all had their backs broken. Winchester's gruesome signature. He paralyzed his victims so they couldn't run away or even fight him. He was a coward. We haven't discussed what he did to her over the course of the twelve days he'd had her. She'll tell me when she's ready, and I will listen, knowing I've meted out the justice she deserves. Late that first night, I did ask how it all happened, how she managed to find me. I was holding her hand, and she was trying and failing to sleep. We talked quietly, low. How did you get me the watch? She looks distant and eternal, like she's touched the sky and the stars and they've left a mark on her. I don't know. Not really. It was like a dream. He took it off the... The first time, put it on the dresser. When he started to hurt me, I fought back. He slugged me, flipped me over onto the floor and stomped on my back. And I got all kinds of floaty. That's when I had the dream. I dreamed of you, Zach, and I knew you could help me. I got up, walked away from him and the things he was doing, took the watch, and found you. I know it doesn't make any sense. I don't care if it makes sense or not. I am so proud of you, honey. So proud. I'm not kidding. It doesn't matter how she managed to leave her body and find me. All that matters is she's going to be okay and she's going to be mine. Torres and his team have already found six bodies buried on the ranch property, plus the bones of a male Caucasian in an abandoned well three miles from the barns. It will take a while to sort out who is who, and the ranch covers so many thousands of acres, they will be searching for a while. But they are calling the mission a success. A sad success, but so many families will finally know what happened to their loved ones. They're lost girls, because my brave Autumn found me and gave me the piece of the puzzle they needed to take down a prolific, sick serial killer. Autumn has made a request of me, so I've left her in the room and I'm off to fulfill her dearest wish at the moment, to find some obscure Austin ice cream she loves. This morning when I walked in, she was smiling and humming to herself. When she saw me, I swear there was a sparkle in her eyes again. Last night, she told me she wants to come back home. Not only to Nashville, but home to me. Home to our interrupted life. I don't know what Christmas miracle has occurred between us, but I welcome every minute I get to spend with Autumn. Maybe being apart so long has given me a deeper appreciation of what love is, and how bleak life is without it. Maybe the girl outside Mercy Lounge really was an angel, and when she gave me her smokes, she gave me some sort of blessing, a new lease on life, or opened a plane that allowed Autumn through. I will never know. I find the ice cream shop. It's next to a jewelry store. The old me, the Zack who doesn't believe in miracles, would walk right past. But I go inside, happy for the warmth of a glassed-in store. A dark-haired woman is working behind the counter. She looks up and smiles as I approach. Looking for something special? I am, something pretty. It's a late present, a very, very late Christmas present. Twenty minutes later, I have a small velvet box in my front pocket and a carton of salted caramel coffee crunch ice cream freezing my hand off. The walk back to the hospital isn't quite as cold. Autumn is clean and fresh, smiling widely when she sees me. Her hair is glistening. The nurse let me have a shower. I had to stay lying down, but I feel human again. I'm glad. I like your hair short, by the way. I don't know. I was thinking about growing it out again, for old time's sake. She spies the ice cream. Oh, Zach, you found it! I present it to her, with the small wooden paddle spoon attached. I'm a miracle worker. Her eyes meet mine. The bruises are fading. Soon she'll look like she always did, peaches and cream and freckles. There are a few new lines around her eyes. I like them. She's gone to hell and she's come back. 
She's going to get better, and I will love her no matter what happens and what choices she makes. Her hand reaches out and catches mine, and she squeezes hard. Thank you for not giving up on me. I never have, Autumn, and I never will. Now, eat your ice cream. I love you, Zach. I've always loved you. I want you to know that. She nods once, as if resigning herself to her fate, then opens the top of the ice cream. It comes off easily. She gasps. The ring is nestled in the ribbon of caramel. Hey, it's an impromptu proposal. Don't judge. I'm thinking on my feet here. Autumn is crying and laughing through her tears. I have never seen her look more beautiful. I drop to my knees by her bed and say the words I've wanted to utter for a decade. Merry Christmas, Autumn. Will you marry me? Oh, in case you were wondering, we got married on Christmas Day at St. George's in Belle Mead. Guilty pleasures played at the reception. Autumn and I danced all night. Have I ever mentioned how much I love Christmas? About the story. For months now, every time I get on a plane, I start my music and listen to Airborne Toxic Events' excellent song sometime around midnight. There is something about this old song that lends itself to story. I have used it on several of my book soundtracks, and for each book, the song inspired different aspects of the story, of character development, of setting. It's a universal tune, one of great love and extreme pain. I think we've all been in the position of losing someone we love and seeing them soon after, when the hurts are soothed but not forgotten with someone else. It's heartbreaking and a universal pain. It's become in many ways my favorite song. Earlier this year, when Amy, my co-publisher on Two Tales Press, asked me to put together a Christmas short story, I immediately thought of my song. I've mined the hurt and fear and angst and bad decision genes that go along with it, but I'd never written something directly inspired by it. Right around this time, I rewatched a favorite movie, 500 Days of Summer, starring Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Zoe Deschanel. It's a great look at how love changes people for better and for worse. So armed with tons of breakup angst, I set out to write a story worthy of the emotions of young men broken in two by women they love. I knew only three things. There had to be a ghost. It had to revolve around Christmas. And since this is a J.T. Ellison story, it had to have a twist. Now I just needed a title. Something unique. Something cool. Something Christmassy, but uniquely me. I had heard of the Omen Days. Twelve Tide the origins of the 12 days of Christmas, during my research on the immortals. Some quick research brought the legends back to the fore, and I knew immediately what my story was going to be, and how it was going to happen. And the Omen Days was born. Autumn and Zack and Jim and Stephen and Torres, and that bastard Winchester, they paraded onto the page and told me their tales. I'm also especially excited that this is the first story I've written expressly for my publishing house, Two Tales Press. If you liked this one, I encourage you to leave a review and help me spread the word. And feel free to check out my others on the website, because without you, there are no stories. Lastly, if you ever get a chance to see Guilty Pleasures play in Nashville, do it. They are the bomb. For your enjoyment, we've put together a Spotify playlist of all the songs mentioned or referenced in the story, and some more from Guilty Pleasure's show playlists over the years. Merry everything to you and yours. J.T. Ellison, Nashville, December 2015 
This has been Stories of the Night, Four Shadowy Tales, written by J.T. Ellison, narrated by Courtney Parker and Basil Sands, copyright 2018 by J.T. Ellison, production copyright 2018 by J.T. Ellison.